section 22 of Inventions in the Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mario Pineda. Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle. Woodworking. In surveying the wonderful road along which have traveled the toiling inventors until the splendid fields of the present century have been reached, the mind indulges in contrasts and reverts to the far gone period of man's deprivations when man, the animal, was fighting for food and shelter. Poor naked wretches, wheresoever you are, that by the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides your looped and widowed raggedness defend you from seasons such as these? King Lear the Third, Fourth. When the implements of labor and the weapons of war were chiefly made of stone or bronze or iron, such periods became the age of stone or bronze or iron, and we sometimes hear of the ages of steam, steel, and electricity. But the age of wood has always existed wherever forests abounded. It was doubtless the earliest age in the industries of man, but is not likely to be the latest, as the class of inventions we are about to consider, although giving complete dominion to man over the forests, are hastening their destruction. As in every other class of inventions, there had been inventions in the class of woodworking through the ages preceding this century, in tools, implements, and machines, but not until near the close of the 18th century had there been much of a break in the universal toil by hand. The implements produced were, for the most part, the result of the slow growth of experience and mechanical skill rather than the product of inventive genius. True, the turning lathe, the axe, the hammer, the chisel, the saw, the auger, the plane, the screw, and cutting and other wood-shaping instruments in simple forms existed in abundance. The Egyptians used their saws of bronze. The Greeks deified their supposed inventor of the saw, Talus, or Perdix, and they claimed Theodore of Lamus as the inventor of the turning lathe, although the main idea of pivoting an object between two supports so that it could be turned while the hands were free to apply a tool to its shaping was old in the potter's will of the Egyptians which was turned while the vessel resting upon it was shaped and ornamented by the hand and tools. It appears also to have been known by the Hindus and the Africans. Pliny refers to the curled ships raised by the plain, and Ansonius refers to mills driven by the waters of the Moselle for sawing marble into slabs. Early records mention saw mills run by water power in the 13th century in France, Germany, and Norway and Sweden had them in the next century. Holland had them 100 years at least before they were introduced into England. Fearful of the entire destruction of the forests by the wood used in the manufacture of iron and incited by the opposition and jealousy of hand sawyers, England passed some rigid laws on the subject in the 16th and 17th centuries, which, although preserving the forests, gave for a long time the almost exclusive manufacture of iron and lumber to Germany and Holland. Even as late as 1768, a sawmill built at Limehouse, under the encouragement of the Society of Arts by James Stanfield, was destroyed by a mob. Sawmills designed to be run by water power had been introduced into the American colonies by the Dutch more than a century before they made their appearance in England. William Penn found that they had long been at work on the Delaware when he reached its shores in 1682. It was nothing indigenous to the climate or race that rendered the Americans inventors. The early colonists, drawn from the most civilized countries of Europe, carried to the New World knowledge of the latest and best appliances known to the respective countries in the various arts. With 3,000 miles of water between them, and the source of such appliances, and between them and the source of arbitrary power and laws to hamper efforts and enterprise, with stern necessity on every hand, prompting them to avail themselves of every means to meet their daily wants, 
all known inventions were put to use and brains were constantly exercised in devising new means to aid or take the place of manual labor which was scarce surrounded too by vast forests from which their houses their churches and their schools must be constructed these pioneers naturally turned their thoughts toward woodworking machinery the attention to this art necessarily created interest in and developed other arts thus constant devotion to pursuits strenuously demanding labor serbian devices evolved a race of keen inventors and mechanics so that when watt had developed his wonderful application of steam to industrial purposes america was ready to substitute steam for water power in the running of sawmills steam sawmills commenced to buzz with the opening of the century as to the relation of that humble machine the sawmill to the progress of civilization it was once said the axe produces the log hut but not until the sawmill is introduced do frame dwellings and villages arise it is civilization's pioneer machine the precursor of the carpenter will write and turner the painter the joiner and legions of other professions progress is unknown where it is not its comparative absence in the southern american continent was not the least cause of the trifling advancement made there during three centuries and a half surrounded by forests of the most valuable and variegated timber with water power in mountain streams equally neglected the masses of the people lived in shanties and mud hovels not more commodious than those of the aborigines nor more durable than the annual structures of birds wherever man has not fixed and comfortable homes he is as regards civilization stationary improvement under such circumstances has never taken place nor can it miller in england in seventeen seventy seven had described in his patent a circular saw and Haddon, in 1776, had vaguely described a planing machine. But the inception of the marvelous growth in woodworking machinery in the 19th century occurred in England during the last decade of the 18th. It was due to the splendid efforts of General Samuel Bentham and of Brahma and Branch, both as to metalworking and woodworking machinery. General Bentham, a brother of the celebrated jurist Jeremy Bentham, had his attention drawn to the slow, laborious, and crude methods of working in wood while making a tour of Europe, and especially in Russia, and engaged in inspecting the art of shipbuilding in those countries in behalf of the British Admiralty. On his return, 1791-1792, he converted his home into a shop for making woodworking machines. This included planing, molding, rabbiting, grooving, mortising and sawing both in coarse and fine work in curved winding and transverse directions and shaping wood in complicated forms of the amount of bills presented to and paid for by the admiralty for these machines general bentham received about twenty thousand pounds these machines were developed and in use just as the new century approached thus with the exception of the sawmill it may be again said that prior to this century the means mankind had to aid them in their work in metals and in wood were confined to hand tools and these were for the most part of a simple and crude description the groundwork now being laid the century advanced into a region of invention in tools and machinery for woodworking of every description far beyond the wildest dreams of all former carpenters and joiners not only were the machines themselves invented but they gave rise in turn to a host of inventions in metalworking for making them in the same line of inventions there appeared in the first decade of the century one of the most ingenious of men and a most fitting type of that great class of yankee inventors who have carved their way to renown with all implements from the jackknife to the electrically driven universal shaping machine thomas blanchard born in massachusetts in 1788 while a boy was accustomed to astonish his companions by the miniature wind wheels and water wheels that he whittled out with his knife while attending the parties of young people who gathered on winter evenings at different homes in the country to pare apples the idea of a paring machine occurred to him 
and when only 13 years of age, he invented and made the first apple pairing machine with which more apples could be paired in a given time than any 12 of his girl acquaintances could pair with a knife. At 18, while working in a shop, driving the heads down on tacks on an anvil with a hammer, he invented the first tack forming machine which, when perfected by him, made 500 tacks a minute and which has never since been improved in principle. He improved the steam engine and invented one of the first envelope machines. He made the first metal lathe for cutting out the butts of garden barrels. But his greatest triumphs were in woodworking machinery. Challenged to make a machine that would make a gun stuck, always before that time regarded an impossible task, its every part being so irregular in form, he secluded himself in his workshop for six months, and after constant labor and experiments, he at the end of that time had produced a machine that more than astonished the entire world, and which worked a revolution in the making of all irregular forms from wood. This was in 1819. This machine would not only make a perfect gun stock, but shoe lasts and ships tackle blocks, axe handles, and a multitude of irregular shaped blocks which before had always required the most expert hand operatives to produce. This machine became the subject of parliamentary inquiry on the part of England, and so great were the doubts concerning it that successive commissions were appointed to examine and report upon it. Finally, the English government ordered eight or ten of such machines for the making of gun stocks for its army, and paid Blanchard about $40,000 for them. He was once jestingly asked at the Navy Department at Washington if he could turn a 74. He at once replied, Yes, if you will furnish me the block. Of course, infringers appeared, but he maintained his rights and title as first and original inventor after the most searching trials in court. The generic idea of Blanchard's lathe for turning irregular forms consists in the use of a pattern of a device which is to be shaped from the rough material, placing such pattern in a lathe alongside of the rough block and having a guide wheel which has an arm having cutters and which guide follows all the lines of the pattern and which cutters, extending to the rough material, chip it away to the depth and in the direction imparted by the pattern lines to the guide, thus producing from the rough block a perfect representation of the pattern. In the midst of his studies in the construction of his inventions, Blanchard's attention was drawn to the operations of a boring worm upon an old oak log. Closely examining and watching the same by the aid of a microscope, he gained valuable ideas from the work of his humble teacher, which he incorporated into his new cutting and boring machines. His series of machines in gun making were designed to make and shape automatically every part of the gun whether of wood or metal. His machines and subsequent improvements by others for boring, mortising and turning display wonderful ingenuity. A modern mortising machine, for instance, is adapted to quickly and accurately cut the square or oblong hole to any desired depth, width and length by cutting blades. To automatically reciprocate the cutters both vertically and horizontally in order to cut the mortise, both as to length and depth at one time, and to automatically withdraw the cutters when they have finished cutting the mortise. They are provided with simple means for setting and fitting the cutters to do this work, and while giving the cutters a positive action, ample clearance is provided for the removal of the chips as fast as they are cut. From what such inventions will produce in the way of complicated and ornamental workmanship, we may conclude that it is a law of invention that whatever can be made by hand may be made by a machine and made better. Carving machines made their appearance early in this century. In 1800, a Mr. Watt of London produced one on which he carved medallions and figures in ivory and ebony. Also subsequently, John Hawkins of the same city and a Mr. Cheverton invented machines for the same purpose. Another Englishman, Braithwaite, in 1840, invented a most attractive carving process in which, instead of cutting tools, he employed burning as his agent. Heated casts of previously carved models were pressed into or onto wet wood. 
and the charcoal surfaces, then brushed off with hard brushes. After Blanchard's turning lathes and boring apparatus, appeared machines in which a series of cutters were employed, guided by a tracing lever attached to a carved model and actuating the cutter to reproduce on material placed upon an adjusting table a copy of the model. Machines have been invented which consist of hard iron or steel rotors on the surface of which are cut beautiful patterns and between which wood previously softened by steam is passed and designs thus impressed thereon. A similar process of embossing was devised in Paris and called siloplasty by which steam softened wood is compressed in carved molds which give it bas relief impressions. But in the carving of wood by hand a beautiful art which has been revived within the past generation, there are touches of sentiment, taste and human toil, which, like the touches of the painter and the master of music, appeal to cultivated minds in a higher than mechanical sense. The meals of the modern gods, the inventors, grind with exceeding and exact fineness, but the work of a human hand upon a manufactured article still appeals to human sympathy. The bending of wood when heated by fire or steam had been known and practiced to a limited extent, but Blanchard invented a clamping machine to which improvements have been added and by which ship timbers, furniture, plows, piano frames, carriage paws, stair and house banisters and balusters, wheel rims, staves, etc., etc., are bent to the desired forms and without breaking. Bending to a certain extent does not weaken wood, but the stretching the same has been found to impair and destroy its strength. The principal problems which the inventors of the century have solved in the class of woodworking have been the adaptation to rapid working machinery of the saw and other blades, to sever, the plane to smooth, the auger, the bead and the gimlet to bore, the hammer to drive, and a combination of all or a part of this to shape and finish the completed article. It was a great step from the reciprocating hand saw, worked painfully by one or two men, to the band saw invented by a London mechanic, William Newbery, in 1808. This was an endless steel belt serrated on one edge, mounted on pulleys, and driven continuously by the power of steam through the hardest and the heaviest work. Pliable, to conform to the faces of the wheels over which it is carried, it will bend with all the sinuosities of long timber. No time is lost in its operation, and no labor of human hands is necessary to guide it or the object on which it works. At the Vienna Exposition in 1873, the first mammoth saw of this description was exhibited. The saw itself was made by the celebrated firm of Perrin and Company of Paris, Upon machinery, the drawings of which were made by Mr. Van Pelt of New York and constructed by Richards, Lodun, and Kelly of Philadelphia. The saw was 55 feet long and sawed planks from a pine log 3 feet thick at the rate of 60 superficial feet per minute. The difficulty of securing a perfectly reliable weld in the endless steel band was overcome by Mr. Perrin who received at the Paris Exhibition in 1867 the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honor. Now gangs of such saws may be found in America and elsewhere, and circular saws have also been added. Saws that both cut, form, and plane the boards at the same time are now known. Boring tools, both for hand and machinery, demanded improvement. Formerly augers and similar boring tools had merely a curved sharpened end and a concavity to hold the chips, and the whole tool had to be withdrawn to empty the chips. It was known as a pod auger. In 1809, Le Medieu, a Frenchman, invented an auger with two pods and cotton lips, a central screw, and a twisted shank. About the same time, Lilly of Connecticut made a twisted auger, and this screw forms twisted cutting tools of various kinds with their cutting lips and by which the shavings of chips were withdrawn continuously from the hull as the cutting proceeded became so improved in the United States that they were known as the American augers and bits. The planing machines of General Bentham were improved by Brahma 
and he and Maudsley also greatly improved other woodworking machines and tools in England, 1802-1810. We have before, in the chapter on metalworking, shown the importance of the slide rest, planner and lathe when combined and which also are extensively adapted to woodworking. In Brahma's machine, a vertical spindle carried at its lower extremity a horizontal wheel having 28 cutter blades, followed by a plane also attached to a wheel. A board was by this means perfectly trimmed and smooth from end to end, and it was carried against the cutters by suitable moving means. William Woodworth of New York in 1828 patented a celebrated planing machine which became so popular and its use was regarded so necessary in the woodworking trades that the patent was looked upon as an odious monopoly. It consisted of a combination of rollers armed with cutters attached to a horizontal shaft revolving at a great speed and of means for fitting the boards to the cutters. With Bentham's, Brahman's, Blanchard's and Woodward's ideas for a basis, those innumerable improvements have been made in machinery by which wood is converted with almost lining rapidity into all the forms in which we see it, whether ornamental or useful, in modern homes and other structures. Some machines are known as universal wood workers. In this, a single machine is provided with various tools and adapted to perform a great variety of work by shifting the position of the material and the tools. The following operations can be performed on such a machine, planing, beveling, tapering, tenoning, tonguing, and grooving, grooves straight, circular or angular, making of joints, twisting, and a number of other operations. The later invention by Stow of Philadelphia of a flexible shaft made up of a series of coils of steel wire given a leather covering and to which can be attached augers beads or metal drills, the tool applied to its work from any direction and its direction varied while at work has excited great attention. Shingles are as old in the art as the framework of buildings. Rome was roofed with shingles for centuries made of oak or pine. Tiles, plain and fancy, and slates have to a certain extent superseded wood shingling, but the wood will always be used where it can be found in plenty, as machines will now turn them out complete faster than they can be hauled away. A shingle is a thin piece of wood, thicker at one end than at the other, having parallel sides, about three times as long as it is wide, having generally smooth surfaces and edges. All these features are now given to the shingle by modern machines. A great log is rolled into a mill at one end and soon comes out at the other in bundles of shingles, the logs sawed into blocks, the blocks split or sawed again into shingle sizes, tapered, planed in the direction of the grain of the wood, the complete shingles collected and bound in bundles, each operation by a special machine or by a series of mechanisms. Veneering, that art of covering cheap or ordinary wood with a thin covering of more ornamental and valuable wood, known from the days of the Egyptians, has been vastly extended by modern machinery. The practice, however, so emphatically denounced centuries ago by Pliny as the monstrous invention of paint and dyes applied to the woods or veneers to imitate other woods has yet its practitioners and admirers. T. M. Brunel, in 1805-1808, devised a set of circular saws run by steam engines which cut sheets of rosewood and mahogany one-fourteenth of an inch thick with great speed and accuracy. Since that day, the veneer planning machine for delicately smoothing the sheets, the strengthening machine for straightening scrolls that have been cut from logs, the polishing machines for giving the sheets their bright and glossy appearance, the pressing machine for applying them to the surfaces to which they are to be attached, the hammering machine for forcing out superfluous glue from between a veneer and the piece to which it is applied. All of these and numerous modifications of the same have been invented and resulted in placing in the homes everywhere many beautiful ornamental articles of furniture 
which before the very rich only could afford to have. Special forms of machinery for making various articles of wood are about as numerous as the articles themselves. We appear before the house and know before entering that its doors and sills, clapboards and window frames, its sashes and blinds, its cornices, its embrasures and pillars and shingles, each or all have had a special machine embedded for its manufacture. We enter the house and find it is so with objects within. The flooring may be adorned with the beautiful art of marquetry and parquetry, wood mosaic work, the wainscoting and the frescoes and ceilings, the stairs and staircases, its carved and ornamental supporting frames and balusters, the charming mantel frames around the hospitable fireplaces, and every article of furniture we see in which wood is a part. So too, it is with every useful wooden implement and article within and without the house, the trays, the buckets, the barrels, the tubs, the clothespins, the broom handles, the mops, the ironing and breadboards. And outside the house, the fences, railings and posts, many of these objects entirely unknown to the poor of former generations, uncommon with the rich, and the machinery for making them unknown to all. It was a noble array of woodwork and machinery with which the nations surprised and greeted the world at each of its notable international expositions during the century. Each occasion surpassed its predecessor in the beauty of construction of the machines displayed and efficiency of their work. The names of the members of this array were hard and uncouth, such as the axe, the adze, and the bit, the auger, bark cutting and grinding machines, blind slat boring and tannoning, dovetail, mortising, matching and planing, wood splitting, turning, wheeling and planing, wood bending, ring boring, dough walling, felly joining, etc., etc. These names and the clamor of the machines were painful to the ear, but to the thoughtful they were converted into sweeter music when reflection brought to mind the hard toil of human hands they had saved, the before unknown comforts and blessings of civilization they had brought and were bringing to the human race, and the enduring forms of beauty they had produced. To the invention of woodworking machinery, we are also indebted for the awakening of interest in the qualities of wood for a vast number of artistic purposes. It was a revelation at the Great Philadelphia Exposition of 1876 to behold the specimens of different woods from all the forests of the earth, selected and assembled to display their wonderful grain and other qualities, and showing how well nature was storing up for us in its silent shades those grouts which were waiting the genius of invention to convert into forms of use and beauty for every home. End of section 22。section 23 of inventions in the century。are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。read by mario pineda。inventions in the century by william henry doolittle。furniture。So far as machinery is concerned for converting wood into furniture, the same has been anticipated in the previous chapter, but much remains to be said about the articles of furniture themselves. Although from ancient days the most ancient countries provided by hand elaborate and beautiful articles of furniture of many descriptions, yet it has been left for modern advances in machinery and kindred arts to yield that universal supply of convenient and ornamental furniture which now prevails. The Egyptians used chairs and tables of a more modern form than the Greeks or Romans, who lolled about in couches even at their meals, but the Egyptians did not have the convenient section tables built in sliding sections, which permit the table to be enlarged to accommodate an increased number of guests. And now recently, this modern form of table has been improved by arranging the sections and leaves so that when the sections are slid out, the leaves are automatically raised and placed in position, which is done either by lazy tongues mechanism or by a series of parallel links. Tables constructed with folding detachable and adjustable legs, 
tables constructed for special purposes as sewing machines and typewriting machine tables by which the machine head may be dropped beneath the table top when not in use tables combined with desks wherein the table part may be slid into the desk part when not in use and the sliding cover pulled down to cover and lock from side both the table and desk surgical tables adapted to be raised or lowered at either end or at either side and to be extended knockdown tables adapted to be taken all apart for shipment or storage tables combined with chairs to be folded down by the side of the chair when not in use and many other useful forms have been added to the list much ingenuity has been displayed in the construction of desks to save and economize space mention has been made of a combined folding desk and extensible table another form is an arrangement of desk drawers whereby when one drawer is locked or unlocked all the rest are locked or unlocked automatically whatever shape or function anyone desires in a desk may be met except perhaps the performance of the actual work of the occupant in the matter of beds the principal development have been due to the advancement of woodworking machinery and the manufacture of iron steel and brass the old-fashioned ponderous bedsteads put together by heavy screws have given way to those mortins and tenoned joined and matched and by which they can easily be put up and taken down and to iron and brass bedsteads which are both ornamental and more helpful no bed may be without an inexpensive steel spring frame or mattress for the support of the bedding folding beds made to economize space and when folded upright become an ornamental bureau and invalid bedsteads designed for shifting the position of the invalid are among the many modern improvements kitchen utensils a vast amount of drudgery in the kitchen has been relieved by the convenient inventions in labor-saving appliances coffee and spice mills can openers stationary wash tubs stopper tractors superseding the old style of hand cork screws where large numbers of bottles are to be uncorked refrigerators and provision safes attaching and lifting devices and convenient culinary dishes and utensils of great variety curtains shades and screens have been wonderfully improved and their use made widely possible by modern inventions and new adaptation of old methods wood cotton silk paper combined or uncombined with other materials in many noble ways unknown to our ancestors have rendered these articles available in thousands of homes where their use was unknown and impossible a century ago among the most convenient attachments to shades is the spring roller invented by hartshorn of america in eighteen sixty four whereby the shade is automatically rolled upon its stick to raise or lower it window screens for the purpose of excluding flies mosquitoes and other insects while freely admitting the air are now made extensible and adjustable in different ways to fit different sizes of windows gardens and shades are provided with neat and most attractive supporting roads to which they are attached by brass or wooden rings and provided with easily manipulated devices to raise and securely hold them in any desired position the art of steaming wood and bending it by iron pattern forms adjustable to the forms desired as particularly devised in principle by blanchard in america in eighteen twenty eight eighteen forty referred to in woodworking has produced great changes in the art of furniture making especially in chairs a particularly interesting illustration of the result of this art occurred in austria about forty years ago the manufacturing in germany and austria of furniture by machinery especially of bent woodware became well established there and by the time of the vienna exposition in 1873 factories on a most extensive scale for the construction of bed furniture were in operation among the vast mountain beach forests of moravia and hungary the greatest of these works were located in great ergris hungary and bistritz moravia with twenty or more auxiliary establishments between five and six thousand workpeople were employed the greater part of whom were females and it was necessary to use steam and water motors 
to the extent of many hundred horsepower. The forests were felled and the tree tops removed and made into charcoal for use in the glass works of Bohemia. The trunks were hauled to the mills and sawed into planks of suitable thickness by gong saws. The planks in turn were cut with circular saws into square pieces for turning and then the pieces turned and cut on lathes to give them the size required and the rounded shape. The pieces then steamed while in their green state for 24 hours in suitable boilers, then taken out and bent to the desired shape on a cast iron frame by hand, then subjected with the desired pattern to the pattern turning table and cut, then kept locked in the pattern's iron embrace until the pieces were dried and permanently set in shape then clamped to a bench, filed, rasped, stained, and French polished by the deft hands of the women, then assembled in proper position in frames of the form of the chair or other article to be made, their contact surface sawed to fit at the joints, and then finally the parts glued together and further secured by the addition of a few screws or bolts. Chairs, lounges, and lighter furniture were thus made from bent pieces of wood with very few joints, having a neat and attractive appearance and possessing great strength. The art has spread to other forests and other countries, and the turned, bent, highly polished and beautiful furniture of this generation would have been but a dream of beauty to the householder of a century ago. Children's chairs are made so that the seat may be raised or lowered or the chair converted into a perambulator. Dentists' chairs have been developed until it is only necessary for the operator to turn the valve governing a fluid, generally oil, under pressure to raise or lower the chair and the patient. In the more agreeable situation of the theater or concert, one may hang his hat on the bottom of the chair, upturn it to afford access to it through a crowded row, and turning down the chair, sit with pleasure as the curtain is rolled up by compressed air or electricity at the touch of a button. To the unthinking and unobserving, the subject of bottle stoppers is not entrancing, but those acquainted with the art know with what long, continuous, earnest efforts thousands of inventors have sought for the best and cheapest bottle stopper to take the place of corks, the enormous demand for which was exhausting the supply and rendering their price almost prohibitive. One of the most successful types is a stopper of rubber combined with a metal disc and hung by a wire on the neck of the bottle so that the stopper can be used over and over again. Another form composed of glass or porcelain and cork. Another is a thin disc of cork placed in a thin metal cap which is crimped over a shoulder on the neck of the bottle and still another is a thin disc of pasteboard adapted for milk bottles and pressed tightly within a rim on the inside of the neck of the bottle. In this connection should be mentioned that self-sealing fruit jar, known from its inventor as Mason's fruit jar, which came into such universal use, that combination of screw cap, the screw threaded jar neck, and the rubber ring or gasket, on which the cap was screwed so tightly as to seal the jar hermetically. In lamp lighting, what a wonderful change from the old oil lamps of former ages. The modern lamp may be said to be an improved means of grace, as it will hold out much longer and shed a far more attractive light for the sinner, whose return by its genial light is, even to the end, so greatly desired. The discovery of petroleum and its introduction as a light produced a revolution in the construction of lamps. Wicks were not discarded, but changed in shape from round to flat, and owing to the coarseness and disagreeable odor of coal oil, especially in its early unrefined days, devices first had for their object the easy feeding of the weak and perfect combustion. To this end, the burner portion through which the wick passed was perforated at its base to create a proper draft, and later the cap over the base was also perforated. But with refined oil, the disagreeable odor continued. It was found that this was mainly due to the fact that both in lamps and stubs, the oil would ooze out of the wick 
on to the adjacent parts of the lamps or stove, and when the wick was lit, the heat would burn or heat the oil, and thus produce the other. Inventors, therefore, contrived to separate the oil reservoir and wick part when the lamp or stub were not in use, and finally, in stubs, to dispense with the wick altogether. As wickless oil stubs are now in successful use, the wickless lamp may be expected to follow. The lamp, however, that throws all others into the shade is that odorless, heatless, magic, mellow, tempered light of electricity that springs out from the little filament in its hermetically sealed glass cage and shines with unsurpassed loveliness on all those fortunate enough to possess it. End of section 23「Section 24 of Inventions in the Century」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle Leather It is interesting to speculate how prehistoric man came to use the skin of the beasts of the field for warmth and shelter. Originally, no doubt, and for untold centuries, the use was confined to the hairy, undressed, fresh or dried skins, known as pelts. Then came the use of better tools. The garments have perished, but the tools of stone and of bronze survived, which, when compared with those employed among the earliest disturbed tribes of men, were found to be adapted to cut and strip the hairy covering from the bodies of animals, and clean, pound, scrape, and otherwise adapt them to use. And ever since the story of man began to be preserved in lasting records, from farthest oriental to the northernmost limits of Europe and America, memorials of the early implements of labor in the preparation of hides for human wear have been found. The Aborigines knew how to sharpen bones of animals they killed to scrape, clean, soften, or roughen their skins. They knew how to sweat, dry, and smoke the skins, and this crude seasoning process was the forerunner of modern tanning. But leather as we know it now, that soft, flexible, insoluble combination of the gelatine and fibrine of the skin with tannic acid, producing a durable and imputrescible article that will withstand decay from the joint attack of moisture, warmth, and air, was unknown to the earlier races of men for its production was due to thorough tanning, and thorough tanning was a later art. When men were skin-dressed animals, they knew little or nothing of tanning. Tannic acid is found in nearly every plant that grows, and its combination with the fresh skin spread or thrown thereon may have given rise to the observation of the beneficial result and subsequent practice. But whether discovered by chance, accident, or experience, or invented from necessity, the art of tanning should have rendered the name of the discoverer immortal. The earliest records, however, describe the art, but not the inventor. From the time the Hebrews covered the altars of their tabernacles with ram skin dyed red, as recorded in Exodus, when they and the Egyptians worked their leather, currying it, stretching it with their knives, awls, stones, and other implements, making leather water buckets, resembling very much those now made by machinery, covering their harps and shields with leather, ornamental and embossed, from the days of the early Africans, famous for their yellow, red, and black morocco, from the days of the old national dress of the Persians with their leather trousers, aprons, helmets, belts, and shirts, from the time that the ancient Scythians utilized the skins of their enemies, and Herodotus described the beauty and other good qualities of the human hide. From the early days of that peculiar fine and agreeable leather of the Russians, fragrant with the oil of the birch, from the days of the white leather of the Hungarians, the olive tint leather of the Saracens, from the time of the celebrated cordovan leather of the Spaniards, from the ancient cold periods of the Equimox and the Scandinavians, who, clad in the warm skins of the Arctic bears, stretched tough tan seal skin over the framework of their boats, 
from the time of the introduction of the art of the leather worker to the naked Britain, down to almost the 19th century, substantially the same hand tools, hard hand labor, and the old elbow lubricant were known and practiced. Hand tools have improved, of course, as other arts in wooden iron making have developed, but the operations are about the same. They were, and must be, fleshing knives to scrape from off the hide, the adherent flesh and lime. But this, the hide is placed over the convex edge of an inclined beam, and the work is called beaming. The curious knife for removing the hair, skiving, or the cutting off the rough edges and fleshy parts on the border of the hide, shaving and flattening, the cutting away of the inequalities left after skiving, stoning, the rubbing of the leather by a scouring stone to render it smooth, slicking to remove the water and grease, or to smooth and polish by a rectangular sharpened stone, steel or glass tool, whitening to shave off thin strips of the flesh, leaving the leather thinner, whiter and more pliable, stuffing to soften the scraped and pounded hides and make them porous, graining the giving to the hair or grain side a granular appearance by rubbing with a crude or roughened piece of wood, bruising or boarding to make the leather supple and pliable by bringing the two flesh sides together and rubbing with a graining board, scouring by aid of a stream of water to whiten the leather by rubbing with a slicking stone or steel. The inventions of the century consist in labor-saving machinery for these purposes, new tanning and dressing processes, and innumerable machines for making special articles of leather. As before stated, the epoch of modern machinery commenced with the practical application of water power to other than grinding mills and of steam in place of water, contemporaneously with the invention of spinning and weaving machinery in the last half of the 18th century. These got fairly to work at the beginning of the century, and the uses of machinery spread through the treatment of leather. John Bull was the appropriate name of the man who first patented a scraping machine in England about 1780, and Joseph Weeks the next one some years later. One of the earliest machines of the century was the hide mill, which, after the hand tools had scraped and stoned, shaved and hardened the hides, was used to rub and dub them, and soften and swell them for tanning. Pegged rollers were the earliest form for this purpose, and later corrugated rollers and power work hammers were employed. Hundreds of hides could be softened daily by these means. Then came ingenious machines to take the place of the previous operations of the hand tools. The fleshing machine, in one form of which the hides are placed on a curved bed, and the fleshy parts scraped off or removed by revolving glass blades, or by carved teeth of steel and wood in a roller under which a table is given a to and fro movement. Tanning apparatus of a great variety by which hides after they are thoroughly washed and softened, and the pores opened by swelling, are subjected to movements in the tanning liquor vats, such as rocking or oscillating, rotary or vertical, or treated by an air exhaust, known as the vacuum process, in all of which the object is to thoroughly impregnate in the shortest time all the interstices and pores of the skin with the tannic acid, by which the fibrous and gelatinous matter is made to combine to form leather, and by which process also the hide is greatly increased in weight. Real machines are then employed to transfer the hides from one vat to another, thus subjecting them to liquors of increasing strength. Sulking in vats formerly occupied 12 or 18 months, but under the new methods the time has been greatly reduced, and now since 1880, the chemists are pushing aside the vegetable processes and substituting mineral processes, by which tanning is still further shortened and cheapened. The new processes depend chiefly on the use of chromium compounds. Then came scouring machines, in which a rapidly revolving stiff brush is used to scour the grain or hair side, removing the superfluous coloring matter, called the bloom 
and softening and cleansing the hide, by slicking up polishing machines to clean, stretch, and smooth the leather, by glass, stone, or copper blades on a rapidly moving belt, carried over pulleys, whitening, buffing, skiving, fleshing and shaving machines, all for cutting off certain portions and inequalities of the leather, and reducing its thickness. In one form of this class of machines, an oscillating pendulum lever is employed, carrying at its end a revolving cylinder, having thirty or more spiral blades. The pendulum swings to and fro at the rate of ninety movements a minute, while the cylinder rolls over the leather at the rate of two thousand seven hundred eighty revolutions per minute. Scarfing, skiving, chamfering, beveling, feather edging appear to be synonymous terms for a variety of machines for cutting the edges of leather obliquely, with the purpose chiefly of making lamp seams, scarf joints, and reducing the thickness and stiffness of leather at those and certain other points. Then there are leather splitting machines, consisting of one or more rollers and a pressure bar, which draw and press the leather against a horizontally arranged and adjustable knife which nicely splits the leather in two parts, and thus doubles the quantity. This thin split leather is much used in making a cheap quality of boots and shoes and other articles. These are also corrugating, creasing, fluting, pebbling, piercing, and punching machines, machines for grinding the bark and also for grinding the leather, machines for gluing sections of leather together, and machines for sewing them. Machines for rounding flat strips of leather, for the making of whips and tubes. Machines for scalloping the edges, and a very ingenious machine for sorting leather strips of strings according to their size or thickness. The most important improvements of the century in leather working relate to the manufacture of boots and shoes. It could well be said of boots and shoes, especially those made of the great mass of humanity, before the modern improvements and means and processes had been invented. Their feet, through faithless leather, met the dirt. It is true that in the 18th century, both in Europe and America, the art of leather and boot and shoemaking had so far advanced that good durable footwear was produced by long and tedious processes of tanning, and by careful making up of the leather into boots and shoes by hand. The knife, the awl, the wax thread, the nails and hammers and other hand tools of the character above referred to being employed. But the process was a tedious and costly one, and the articles produced were beyond the limits of the poor man's purse. Hence the wooden shoes, and those made of coarse hide and dressed in undressed skins, and of coarse cloth, mixed or unmixed with leather. In 1809, David Mead Randolph of England patented machinery for riveting soles and heels to the uppers instead of sewing them together. The celebrated civil engineer, Isambard M. Brunel, shortly thereafter added several machines of his own invention to Randolph's method, and he established a large manufactory for the making chiefly of army shoes. The various separate processes performed by his machines involved the cutting out of the leather, hardening it by rolling, securing the welt onto the inner sole by small nails, and studding the outer sole with larger nails. Divisions of men were employed to work on each separate step, and the shoes were passed from one process to another until complete. Large quantities of shoes were made at reduced prices, but complaints were made as to the nails penetrating into the shoe and hurting the feet. The demand for army shoes fell off, and the system was abandoned, but it had incited invention in the direction of machine-made shoes, and the day of exclusive hand labor was doomed. About 1818, Joseph Walker of Hopkinton, Massachusetts, invented the wooden peg. Making and applying pegs by hand was too slow work, and machines were at once contrived for making them. As one invention necessitates and begets others, so special forms of machine for sawing and working up wood into pegs were devised. Such machinery was for first sawing the selected log of wood into slices, across the grain a little thicker than the length of a peg, and cutting out knots in the wood, 
then planing the head of the block smooth, grooving the block with a V-shaped cutting tool, splitting the pegs apart, and then bleaching, drying, polishing, and winnowing them. It took 40 or 50 years to perfect these in kindred machines, but at the end of that time there was a factory of Burlington, Vermont, which from four cords of wood made every day 400 bushels of shoe pegs. About 1858, B.F. Sturdivant of Massachusetts made a great improvement in this line. He was a very poor man, getting a living by pegging on the soles of a few pairs of shoes each day. He devised a pegging machine, and out of his scanty earnings and at odd hours, with much pain and labor, and by borrowing money, he finally completed it. The machine made what was called peg wood, a long ribbon strip of seasoned wood, sharpened on one end designed to be fed into the machine for pegging shoes. The shoes were punctured by awls driven by machinery, and then as the peg strip was carried to it, the machine severed the strip into chisel-edged pegs, and peg-driving mechanism drove them into the holes. Nine hundred pegs a minute were driven. It so almost supplanted all peg-driving machines, and after the machines were quite generally introduced, they were made in one year alone in New England, 55 million pairs of boots and shoes pegged by the Sturdivant machines. Other forms of pegs followed, such as the metal screw pegs, and machines to cut them off from a continuous spiral wire from which they were made. Last on which the shoes were made had been manufactured by the hundred thousand on the wood turning maze, invented by Blanchard, described in the chapter on woodworking. In 1858, also, about the same time the Sturdivant pegging machine was introduced, the shoe sewing machine was developed. The McKay Shoe Sewing Machine Company of Massachusetts, after an expenditure of $130,000 and three years' time in experiments, were enabled to put their machines in practical operation. The pegging machines and sewing machines worked a revolution in shoemaking. A revolution in the art of shoemaking thus started was followed by a wondrous machines invented to meet every part of the manufacture. Lasting machines for drawing and fitting the leather over last, in which the outer edges of the leather are drawn over the bottom of the last and tacked thereto by the hands and fingers of the machine instead of those of the human hand, were invented. Indenting machines. The wealth is known as that strip of leather around the shoe between the upper and sole, and machines were invented for cutting and placing this, indenting it for the purpose of rendering it flexible and separating the stitches, all the work until recently entirely done by hand. Machines for twining the seams in the uppers and forming the scallops. Machines especially adapted to the making of the heel, as heel trimming and compressing, rounding and polishing, and for nailing the finished heel to the boot or shoe. Machines for treating the sole in every way, rolling it in place of the good old way of pounding it on a lap stone, trimming, rounding, smoothing, and polishing it. Machines for cutting out gores. Machines for making the upper so that at one operation, every shoe will be stamped by its size, number, name of manufacture, number of case, and any other convenient symbols. Machines for setting the buttons and eyelets. All these are simply members in the long line of inventions in this art. The old style of boot has given way to the modern shoe and gaiter, but for the benefit of those who still wear them, Special machines for shaping the leg, called boot trees, have been contrived. So far had the art advanced that twenty years ago, one working man with much of his improved machinery, combined in one machine called the boot maker, could make three hundred pairs of boots or shoes a day. Upward of three thousand such machines were then at work throughout the world, and one hundred and fifty million pairs of boots were then being made annually thereon. Now the number of machines and pairs of boots and shoes has been quadrupled, and the world is having its feet clothed far more extensively, better and at less cost than was ever possible by the hand system. 
the number of workers in the art, both men and women, has vastly increased instead of being diminished, while their wages have greatly advanced over the old rates. As an illustration of how rapidly modern enterprise and invention proceeds in Yankee land, it has been related that some years ago in Massachusetts, after many of these shoemaking machines had gone into use, a factory which was turning out 2,400 pairs of shoes every day was completely destroyed by fire on a Wednesday night. On Thursday, the manufacturer hired a neighboring building and set carpenters at work, fitting it up. On Friday, he ordered a new and complete outfit of machinery from Boston. On Saturday, the machinery arrived and the men set it up. On Monday, Work was started, and on Tuesday the manufacturer was filling his orders to the full number of 2,400 pairs a day. There are very many people in the world who still prefer the handmade shoe, and there is nothing to prevent the world generally from going back to that system if they choose. But St. Crispin's gentle art has blossomed into a vaster field of blessings for mankind under the fruitful impetus of invention than if left to vegetate under the simple processes of primitive man. Horses, no less than men, have shared in the improvement in leather manufacture. The harnesses of the farmers and laboring man's horses a century ago, when they were fortunate enough to own horses, were the crudest description. Ropes, cords, coarse bands of leather were the common provisions. Now the strength and cheapness of harnesses enabled the poor man to equip his horse with a working suit impossible to have been produced a hundred years ago. To the beautiful effects produced by the use of modern embossing machines on paper and wood have been added many charming patterns in embossed leather. Books and leather cases, saddlery and household ornamentation of various descriptions have been either molded into forms of beauty or stamped or rolled by cameo in intaglio designs cut into the surface of fast-moving cylinders. The leather manufacturers have become so vastly important and valuable in some countries, especially in the United States, second almost to agricultural products, that it would be very interesting to extend the description to many processes and machines, and to facts displaying the enormous traffic in leather now necessarily omitted for want of space. End of section 24。section 25 of Inventions in the Century。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。by Jennifer Beckett Wood. Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle. Minerals, Wells. Dost thou hear the hammer of Thor, wielded in his gloves of iron? As with leather, so with stone. The hand tools and hard labour have not changed in principle since the ancient days. The hammer for breaking, the lever for lifting, the saw for cutting, rubbing stones and irons for smoothing and polishing, sand and water for the same purpose, the mallet and chisel and other implements for ornamenting, the square, the level and the plumb for their respective purposes, all are as old as the art of building. And as for buildings and sculpture of stone and marble made by hand tools, we have yet to excel the pyramids, the Parthenon of Athens, which Earth proudly wears as the best gem upon her zone, the palaces, colosseums, and aqueducts of Rome, the grand and polished tombs of India, the exquisite halls of the Alhambra, and the Gothic cathedrals. But the time came when human blood and toil became too dear to be the possession solely of the rulers and the wealthy, and to be used alone to perpetuate and commemorate riches, power, and glory. Close on the expansion of men's minds came the expansion of steam and the development of modern inventions. 
The first application of the steam engine in fields of human labour was the drawing of water from the coal mines of England, then in drawing the coal itself. It was only a step for the steam engine into a new field of labour when General Bentham introduced his system of wood sawing machinery in 1800, and from sawing wood to sawing stone was only one more step. We find that taken in 1803 in Pennsylvania, when Oliver Evans of Philadelphia drove with a high-pressure steam engine, twelve saws in heavy frames, sawing at the rate of 100 feet of marble in 12 hours. How long would it have taken hand sawyers of marble at ancient Paros and Naxos to have done the same? Stone cutting machines of other forms than sawing then followed. It was desired to divide large blocks generally at the quarries to facilitate transportation. Machines for this purpose are called stone channeling machines. They consist of a gang of chisels bound together and set on a framework which travels on a track adjacent to the stone to be cut, and so arranged that the cutters may be set to the stone at desired angles, moved automatically forward and back in the grooves they are cutting, be fed in or out, raised or lowered, detached and otherwise manipulated in the operation. Other stone cutting machines had for their object the cutting and moulding the edges of tables, mantles and slabs and the cutting of circular and other curved work. In the latter style of machine, the cutter fixed on the end of a spindle is guided in the desired directions on the surface of the stone by a pointer, which, attached to the cutter spindle, moves in the grooves of a pattern also connected to the rotating support carrying the cutter. Other forms of most ingenious stone dressing and carving machines have been devised for cutting mouldings and ornamental figures and devices in accordance with a model or pattern fixed to the underside of the table which carries the stone or marble to be dressed and in which, by means of a guide moving in the pattern, the diamond cutter or cutters carried in a circular frame above the work and adjusted to its surface are moved in the varying directions determined by the pattern. A stream of water is directed on the stone to clear it of the dust during the operations. The carving of stone by machinery is now a sister branch of wood carving. Monuments, ornamentation and intricate forms of figures and characters are wrought with great accuracy by cutting and dressing tools guided by the patterns or directed by the hand of the operator. For the dressing of the faces of grindstones, special forms of cutting machines have been devised. It was a slow and tedious task to drill holes through stone by hand tools, and it was indeed a revolution in this branch of the art when steam engines were employed to rotate a rod armed at its end with diamond or other cutters against the hardest stone. This mode of drilling also effected a revolution in the art of blasting. Then, neither height nor depth, nor thickness of the stone, could prevent progress of the drill rod. Tunnels through mountain walls and wells through solid quartz are cut to the depth of thousands of feet. One instance is related of the wonderful efficiency on a smaller scale of such a machine. The immense columns of the state capital at Columbus, Ohio, were considered too heavy for the foundation on which they rested. The American Diamond Rock Boring Company of Providence, Rhode Island, bored out a 24-inch core from each of the great pillars, and thus relieved the danger. In the most economical and successful stone drills, compressed air is employed as the motive power to drive the drills, which may be used singly or in gangs, and which may be adjusted against the rock or quarry in any direction. When in position and ready for work, a few moments will suffice to bore the holes, apply the explosive and blast the ledge. The cleaning away of submarine ledges in harbours, such as the great work at Hell Gate in the harbour of New York, has thus been effected. Crushing 
Among the most useful inventions relating to stoneworking are machines for crushing stones and ores and assorting them. The old way of hammering by hand was first succeeded by powerful stamp hammers worked by steam. Both methods, of course, are still followed, but they demand too great an expenditure of force and time. About a third of a century ago, Eli Whitney Blake of New Haven, Connecticut, was a pioneer inventor of a new and most successful type of stone-breaking machine, which ever since has been known as the Blake Crusher. This crusher consists of two ponderous upright jaws, one fixed and the other movable, between which the stones or ores are to be crushed are fed. Each of the jaws is lined with the hardest kind of chilled steel. The movable jaw is inclined from its lower end from the fixed jaw, and at its upper end is pivoted to swing on a heavy round iron bar. The movable jaw is forced toward the fixed jaw by two opposite toggle levers, set, in one form of the crusher, at their inner ends in steel bearings of a vertical vibrating rocking lever, one of the toggles bearing at its outer end against the movable jaw and the outer toggle against a solid framework. The rocking lever is operated through a crank by a steam engine, and as it is vibrated, the toggle joint forces the lever end of the movable jaw towards the fixed jaw with immense force, breaking the hardest stone like an eggshell. The setting of the movable jaw at an incline enables the large stone to be first cracked. The movable jaw then opens, and as the stone falls lower between the more contracted jaws, it is broken finer until it is finally crushed or pulverized and falls through at the bottom. The movable jaw is adjustable and can be set to crush stones to a certain size. As the rock drill made a revolution in blasting and tunnelling, so the Blake Crusher revolutionised the art of road making. Road metal, as the supply of broken stones for roads is now called, is the fruit of the crusher. Hundreds of tonnes of stone per day can be crushed to just the size desired and the machine may be moved from place to place where most convenient to use. Other crushers have been invented, formed on the principle of abrasion. The stones, or ore, fall between two great revolving discs, having corrugated steel faces, which are set the desired distance apart, and between which the stones are crushed by the rubbing action. In this style of machine, the principle of a gradual breaking from a coarse to a finer grade is maintained by setting the discs farther apart at the centre where the stone enters and nearer together at their peripheries where the broken stone is discharged. Large, smooth or corrugated rollers, conical discs, concentric rollers armed with teeth of varying sizes and yet so arranged as to preserve the feature of the narrowing throat at the bottom or place of discharge have also been devised and extensively used. A long line of inventions has appeared especially adapted to break up and separate coal into different sizes. To view the various monstrous heaps of assorted coals at the mouth of a coal mine creates an impression that some great witch had imposed on a poor victim the gigantic and seemingly impossible task of breaking and assorting a vast heap of coal into these separate piles within a certain time. A task which also seems to have been miraculously and successfully performed within such an exceedingly short time as to either satisfy or confuse the presiding evil genius. Modern civilization has been developed mostly from steam and coal, and they have been to each other as strong brothers, growing more and more mutually dependent to meet the demands made upon them. The mining of coal and its subsequent treatment for burning, before the invention of the steam engine, were long, painful and laborious tasks, and the steam engine could never have had its modern wants supplied if its power had not been used to supplement, with a hundredfold increased effect, the labour of human hands. It being impracticable to carry steam or the steam engine to the bottom of the mine for work there, compressed air is there employed, 
which is compressed by a steam engine up at the mouth. By this compressed air operated in a cylinder to drive a piston and a connecting rod and a pick, a massive steel pick attached to the rod may be driven in any direction against the wall of coal at the rate of from 90 to 120 blows per minute, and at the same time the discharged, compressed, cold, pure, fresh air flows into and through the mine, affording ventilation when and where most needed. In addition to these great drills, more recent inventors have brought out small machines for single operators, worked by the electric motor. After the coal is lifted out, broken and assorted, it needs to be washed free of the adhering dust and dirt, and for this purpose machines are provided, as well as for screening, loading and weighing. The operations of breaking, assorting and washing are often combined in one machine, while an intermediate hand process for separating the pieces of slate from the coal may be employed. But additional automatic means for separating the coal and slate are provided, consisting in forcing with great power water through the coal as it falls into a chamber, which carries the lighter slate to the top of the chamber, where it is at once drawn off. The chief of machines with ores is the ore mill, which not only breaks up the ore, but grinds or pulverizes it. Some chemical and other processes for reducing ores have been referred to in the chapter on metallurgy. Other mechanical processes consist of separators of various descriptions, a prominent one of which acts on the principle of centrifugal force. The crushed material from a spout being led to the centre of a rapidly rotating disc is thrown off by centrifugal force, and as the lighter portions are thrown farther from the disc, and the heavier portions nearer to the same, the material is automatically assorted as to size and weight. As the disc revolves, these assorted portions fall through properly graded apertures into separate channels of a circular trough, from whence they are swept out by brushes secured to a support revolving with the disc. Many forms of ore washing machines have been invented to treat the ore after it has been reduced to powder. These are known by various names as jiggers, rifflers, concentrators, washing frames, etc. A stream of water is directed on, into and through the mass of pulverised ore and dirt. The dirt and kindred materials, lighter than the ore, are raised and floated towards the top of the receptacle, and carried away while the ore settles. This operation is frequently carried on in connection with amalgamated surfaces over which the metal is passed to still further attract and concentrate the ore. An endless apron travelling over cylinders is sometimes employed, composed of slats, the surface of each of which is coated with an amalgam, and on this belt the powdered ore is spread thinly and carried forward. The vibrations of the belt tend to shake and distribute the ore particles. The amalgam attracts them, the refuse is thrown off as the belt passes down over the cylinder, while the ore particles are retained and brushed off into a proper receptacle. Amalgamators themselves form a large class of inventions. They are known as electric, lead, mercury, plate, vacuum, vapour, etc., by the help of these and a vast number of other kindred inventions, the business of mining in all its branches has been revolutionised and transformed, even within the last half century. With the vast increase in the output of coal and of ores, and the incalculable saving of hand labour, the number of operators has been increased in the same proportion, their wages increased, their hours of labour shortened, and their comforts multiplied in variety and quantity, with a diminished cost. The whole business of mining has been raised from ceaseless darkness and drudgery to light and dignity. Opportunity has been created for miners to become men of standing in the community in which they live, and means provided for educating their children and for obtaining comfortable homes adorned with the refinements of civilization.
Well boring is an ancient art known to the Egyptians and the Chinese. Wells were coeval with Abraham when his servant had the celebrated interview with Rebecca. Jacob's well at Sichar, the ancient Sheshim, has been visited by travellers in all ages and has been minutely described. It is nine feet in diameter and 105 feet deep, made entirely through rock. When visited by Maundrell, it contained 15 feet of water. Night. Some kind of a drill must have been used to have cut so great a depth through rock. The Chinese method of boring wells from time immemorial has been by the use of a sharp chisel-like piece of hard iron on the end of a heavy iron and wooden frame weighing four or five hundred pounds, lifted by a lever and turned by a rattan cord operated by hand, and by which wells from 1,500 to 1,800 feet in depth and five or six inches in diameter have been bored. This method has lately been improved by attaching the chisel part, which is made very heavy, to a rope of peculiar manufacture, which gives the chisel a turn as it strikes, combined with an air pump to suck up from the hole the accumulating dirt and water. Artesian wells appear to have been first known in Europe in the province of Artois, France, in the 13th century, hence their name. The previous state of the art in Egypt, China and elsewhere was not then known. Other modern inventions in well-making machinery have consisted in innumerable devices to supplant manual labour and to meet new conditions. Coal oil Reichenbach, the German chemist, discovered paraffin. Young, soon after, in 1850, patented paraffin oil made from coal. These discoveries, added to the long-observed fact of coal oil floating on streams in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, led to the search for its natural source. The discovery of the reservoirs of petroleum in Pennsylvania in 1855 to 1860 and subsequently of gas, which nature had concealed for so long a time, gave a great impetus to inventions to obtain and control these riches. With earth augers, drills, and drill cleaning and clearing and fishing apparatus, and devices for creating a new flow of oil, and tubing, new forms of packaging, etc., inventors created a new industry. Colonel E. Drake sank the first oil well in Pennsylvania in 1859. Since then, 125,000 oil wells have been drilled in that and neighbouring localities. The world has seldom seen such excitement, except in California on the discovery of gold, as attended the coal oil discovery. The first wells sunk gushed thousands of barrels a day. Farmers and other labouring men went to bed poor and woke up rich. Rocky wildernesses and barren fields suddenly became El Dorados. The burning rivers of oil were a reflection of the golden treasures which flowed into the hands and pockets of thousands, as from a perpetual fountain touched by some great magician's wand. Old methods of boring wells were too slow, and although the underlying principle was the same, the new methods and means invented enabled wells to be bored with one-tenth the labour, in one-tenth the time, and at one-tenth the cost. Many great cities and plains and deserts have been provided with these wells, owing to the ease with which they can now be sunk. Another ingenious method of sinking wells was invented by Colonel N. W. Green at Cortland, New York, in 1862. It became known as the Driven Well, and consisted of a pointed tube provided with holes above the pointed end, and an enclosed tube to prevent the passage of sand or gravel through the holes in the outer tube. When the pointed tube was driven until water was reached, the inner tube was withdrawn and a pump mechanism inserted. This well, so simple, so cheap and effective, has been used in all countries by thousands of farmers on dry plains and by soldiers in many desert lands. With these and modern forms of artesian wells, 
the deserts have literally been made to blossom as the rose. End of section 25「Section 26 of Inventions in the Century」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2023. Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle. Chapter 25 Horology and Instruments of Precision. Time measures all things, but I measure it. So far as we at present know, there were four forms of time-measuring instruments known to antiquity. The sundial, the clepsydra or water clock, the hourglass, and the graduated candle. The sundial, by which time was measured by the shadow cast from a pin, rod, or pillar upon a graduated horizontal plate, the gradations consisting of twelve equal parts in which the hours of the day were divided, were, both as to the instrument and the division of the day into hours, invented by the Babylonians or other Oriental race, set up on the plains of Chaldea, constructed by the Chinese and Hindus, put into various forms by these nations, and adapted, but unimproved, by the learned Greeks and conquering Romans. It appears to have been unknown to the Assyrians and Egyptians, or, if known, its knowledge confined to their wise men, as it does not appear on any of their monuments. The clepsydra, an instrument by which in its earliest form a portion of time was measured by the escape of water from a small orifice in the bottom of a shell or vase, or by which the empty vase, placed in another vessel filled with water, was gradually filled through the orifice and which sank within a certain time, is supposed by many to have preceded the invention of the sundial. At any rate, they were used contemporaneously by the same peoples. In its later form, when the day and night were each divided into twelve hours, the vessel was correspondingly graduated, and a float raised by the inflowing water impelled a pointer attached to the float against the graduations. Plato, it is said, contrived a bell so connected with the pointer that it was struck at each hour of the night. But the best of ancient clepsydras was invented by Stasibius of Alexandria about the middle of the 3rd century BC. He was the pupil of Archimedes, and adopting his master's idea of geared wheels, he mounted a toothed wheel on a shaft extending through the vessel and carrying at one end outside of the vessel a pointer adapted to move around the face of a dial graduated with the twenty-four hours. The vertical toothed rod or rack, adapted to be raised or lowered by a float in a vessel gradually filled with water, engaged a pinion fixed on another horizontal shaft, which pinion in turn engaged the larger wheel. It was not difficult to proportion the parts and control the supply of water to make the point complete its circuit regularly. Then the same inventor dispensed with the wheel, rack, and pinion, and substituted a cord to which a float was attached, passing the cord over a grooved pulley and securing a weight at its other end. The pulley was fixed on the shaft which carried the hour hand. The float was a counterbalance to the weight, and as it was lifted by the water, the weight stretched the cord and turned the pulley, which caused the pointer to move on the tile and indicate the hour. The water thus acted as an escapement to control the motive power. In one form, the water dropped on wheels which had their motion communicated to a small statue that gradually rose and pointed with a rod to the hour upon the tile. Thus, the essential parts of a clock, an escapement, which is a device to control the power in a clock or watch so that it shall act intermittently on the time index, a motive power, which was then water or a weight, a dial to display the hours, and an index to point them out, were invented at this early age. 
but the art advanced practically no further for many centuries. The hourglass is too familiar to need description. The incense sticks of the Chinese, the combustion of which proceeded so slowly and regularly as to render them available for time measures, were the precursors of the graduated candles. With the ungraduated sundial, the Greeks fixed their times for bathing and eating. When the shadow was six feet long, it was time to bathe, when twice that length, it was time to sup. The clepsydra became in Greece a useful instrument to enforce the law in restricting loquacious orators and lawyers to reasonable limits in their addresses. And in Rome, the sundials, the clepsydras, and the hourglass were used for the same purpose, and more generally than in Greece, to regulate the hours of business and pleasure. The graduated candles are chiefly notable as to their use, if not invention, by Alfred the Great in about 883. They were twelve inches long, divided into twelve parts, of which three would burn in one hour. In use, they were shielded from the wind by thin pieces of horn, and thus the horn lantern originated. With them he divided the day into three equal parts, one for religion, one for public affairs, and one for rest and recreation. Useful clocks of wondrous make were described in the annals of the Middle Ages, especially in Germany, made by monks and others for kings, monasteries, and churches. The old Saxon and Teutonic words kliga and glocke, signifying the striking of a bell, and from which the name clock is derived, indicates the early combination of striking and timekeeping mechanism. The records are scant as to the particulars of inventions in horology during the Middle Ages and down to the 16th century, but we know that weights and trains of wheels and springs, and some say pendulums, were used in clockwork, and that the tones of hourly bells floated forth from the dim religious light of old cathedrals. They all appear to have involved in different forms the principle of the old clepsydra, using either weights or water as the motive power to drive a set of wheels and to move a pointer over the face of a dial. Henry de Vick of France, about 1370, constructed a celebrated clock for Charles V, the first nearest approach to modern weight clocks. The weight was used to unwind a cord from a barrel. The barrel was connected to a ratchet, and there were combined therewith a train of toothed wheels and pinions, an escapement consisting of a crown wheel controlled by two pallets, which in turn were operated alternately by two weights on a balanced rod. An hour hand was carried by a shaft of the great wheel, and a dial plate divided into hours. This was a great advance, as a more accurate division of time was had by improving the isochronous properties of the vibrating escapement. But the world was still wanting a timekeeper to record smaller portions of the day than the hour, and a more accurate machine than Vix. Two hundred years nearly elapsed before the next important advance in horology. By this time, great astronomers like Tycho Brahe and Valerius had divided the time-recording dials into minutes and seconds. About 1525, Jakob Zech of Prague invented the fusée, which was reinvented and improved by the celebrated Dr. Hook 125 years later. Small portable clocks, the progenitors of the modern watch, commenced to appear about 1500. It was then that Peter Hele of Nuremberg substituted for weights as the motive power a ribbon of steel, which he wound around a central spindle, connecting one end to a train of wheels to which it gave motion as it unwound. Then followed the famous observation of the swinging lamp by the then young Galileo about 1582 while lounging in the Cathedral of Pisa. The isochronism of the vibrations of the pendulum inferred from this observation was not published or put to practical application in clocks for nearly sixty years afterwards. 
In 1639, Galileo, then old and blind, dictated to his son one of his books in which he discussed the isochronal properties of oscillating bodies, and their adaptation as time measures. He and others had used a pendulum for dividing time, but moved it by hand and counted its vibrations. But Huygens, the great Dutch scientist, about 1556, was the first to explain the principles and properties of the pendulum as a time measurer and to apply it most successfully to clocks. His application of it was to the old clock of Vix. The seventeenth century thus opened up a new era in clock and watchmaking. The investigations, discoveries and inventions of Huygens and other Dutch clockmakers, of Dr. Hook and David Ramsey of England, Hautefeuille of France and a few others, placed the art of clock and watchmaking on the scientific basis on which it has ever since rested. The pendulum and watch springs needed to have their movements controlled and balanced by better escapements. Huygens thought that the pendulum should be long and swing in a cycloidal course, but Dr. Hook found the better way to produce perfect isochronous movements was to cause the pendulum to swing in short arcs, which he accomplished by his invention of the anchor escapement. The fusée, which Dr. Hook reinvented, consists of a conical, spirally grooved pulley around which a chain is wound, and which is connected at one end to a barrel in which the main actuating spring is tightly coiled. The fusée is thus interposed between the wheel train and the spring to equalize the power of the latter. To Dr. Hook must also be credited the invention of that delicate but efficient device, the hairspring balance for watches. His inventions in this line were directed to the best means of utilizing and controlling the force of springs, his motto being ut tensio sic vis, as the tension is, so is the force. Repeating watches to strike the hours, half hours and quarters, made their appearance in the 17th century. In the next century, Arnold made one for George III, as small as an English sixpence. This repeated the hours, halves and quarters, and in it, for the first time in the art, a jewel was used as a bearing for the arbors, and this particular one was a ruby made into a minute cylinder. After the discovery and practical application of weights, springs, wheels, levers and escapements to time mechanisms, subsequent inventions, numerous as they have been, have consisted chiefly, not in the discovery of new principles, but in new methods in the application of old ones. Prior to the 18th century, however, clocks were cumbrous and expensive, and the watches rightly regarded as costly toys, and as to their accuracy in time measuring, the cheaper ones were hardly as satisfactory as the ancient sundials. With the coming of the machine inventions and the new industrial and social ideas of the 18th century came an almost sudden new appreciation of the value of time. Hours, minutes and seconds began to be carefully prized, both by the trades and professions, and the demand from the common people for accurate time records became great. This demand it has been the office of the nineteenth century to supply, and to place clocks and watches within the reach of the poor as well as the rich. While thus lessening the cost of timekeepers, their value has been enhanced by increasing their accuracy and durability. Among the other ideas for which the 18th century was famous in watchmaking was that of dispensing with the key for winding, thus saving the losing of keys and preventing access of dust, an idea which, however, was perfected only in the last half of the 19th century. The 18th century was chiefly distinguished by its scientific improvements in timekeepers to adapt them for astronomical observations and for use at sea, in not only accurately determining the time, but the degrees of longitude. Chronometers were invented, distinguished from watches and clocks, by means by which the fluctuation of the parts caused by the variations in temperature 
are obviated or compensated in clocks what are known as the mercurial and gridiron pendulums were invented respectively toward the close of the eighteenth century by graham and harrison and the latter also subsequently invented the expanding and contracting balance wheel for watches the principle in these appliances is the employment of two different metals which expand unequally and thus maintain a uniformity of operation the dutch with huygens in the lead were long among the leading clockmakers germany ranked next it was in the seventeenth century that a wonderful industry in clock-making there commenced which lasted for two centuries the black forest region of south germany became a famous locality for the manufacture of cheap wooden clocks the system adopted was a minute division of labor from fourteen to twenty thousand hands twenty years ago were employed in the schwarzwald district labor-saving machines were ignored almost entirely the annual production finally reached nearly two million clocks of the value of about five million dollars switzerland in watchmaking followed precisely the example of germany in clockmaking it commenced there in the seventeenth and culminated in the nineteenth century many thousands of its population were engaged in the business and it flourished under the fostering care of the government by the establishment of astronomical observations for testing the adjustment of the best watches the giving of prizes and the establishment and encouragement of schools of horology conducted on thorough scientific methods a quarter of a century ago it was estimated that in switzerland forty thousand persons out of a population of one hundred fifty thousand were engaged in watchmaking and that the annual production sometimes reached one million six hundred thousand completed movements the whole world was their market the united states alone was in eighteen seventy five importing one hundred thirty four thousand watches annually from that country as in germany so one characteristic of the swiss system was a minute subdivision of the labor individuals and entire families had certain parts only to make it is said that the swiss watch passed through the hands of one hundred and thirty different workmen before it was put upon the market the use of machines was also as in germany ignored by this national devotion to a single trade and its subdivision of labor the successful production of complicated watches became great and their prices comparatively low the united states in the commencement of its career and at the opening of the century had no clocks or watches of its own manufacture but it soon followed the example of germany and switzerland and established cheap clock manufactories first of wood and then of metal which became famous and of worldwide use but it could make no headway against the cheap labor of europe in watchmaking and the country was flooded with watches of all qualities principally from switzerland and england finally at the halfway mark in the century the inquiry arose among americans why could not the system of the minute subdivision of human labor followed in watchmaking countries so cheaply and profitably be accomplished by machinery the field was open the prize was great and the government stood ready to grant exclusive patents to every inventor who would devise a new and useful machine the problem was great as the fields abroad had been filled for generations by skilled artisans who had reduced the complicated mechanism of watchmaking to a fine art fortunately the habit had been established in america in several of the leading industries principally in that of firearms of fabricating separate machinery for the independent making of numerous parts of the same implement whereby uniformity and interchangeability were established under such a practice which was known as the american system a duplicate of the smallest part of a complicated machine lost or worn out thousands of miles from the factory could soon be furnished by simply sending the number or name of such required part to the manufacturer or to the nearest dealer in such machines with such encouragement and example the scheme of watchmaking was commenced 
soon large factories were built and by the time of the centennial exhibition in eighteen seventy six the american watch company of waltham massachusetts were enabled to present an exhibit of watch movements made by machinery which astonished the world other great companies in different parts of the country soon followed with the same general system machines working with the apparent intelligence and facility of human minds and hands and with greater mathematical accuracy than was possible with the hands appeared for cutting out the finest teeth from black wheels stamped out from steel or brass for making and cutting the smallest finest threaded screws by the thousands per hour and with greatest uniformity and accuracy for jewel making for cutting and polishing by diamonds or sapphire armed tools the rough unpolished diamond and ruby chrysolite garnet or aquamarine and for boring finishing and setting the same for the formation of the most delicate pins or arbors for the making of the escapements including forks pallets rollers and scape wheels for making springs and balances including the main springs and hair springs for making and setting the stem winding parts for making the cases and engraving the same etc the list would be too long to simply name all the ingenious machines there exhibited and subsequently invented for every important operation it was the aim of these manufacturers to locate every great factory in some quiet and attractive spot free from the dust of town and city and divided into many departments from the blacksmithing to the packing and transportation of the completed article and to conduct every department with the best mechanical and mathematical skill that money and brains could provide the same system was followed with equal success in producing the first-class pocket chronometer for the nicest work to which chronometers can be put thus with every watch and its every part made the exact duplicate of its fellow uniformity in timekeeping has been established and the simile of pope is no longer so correct tis with our judgments as our watches none go just alike yet each believes his own a simple statement of this system illustrates with greater force than an entire volume the revolution the nineteenth century has produced in the useful art of horology and yet the story should not omit reference to the application of the electric system to clocks whereby clocks at distant points of a city or country are connected automatically corrected and set to standard time from a central observatory or other time station great as were the advances in horology during the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries the number of inventions that have been made in the nineteenth century is evidenced by the fact that in the united states alone about four thousand patents have been granted since eighteen hundred which however represent not only american inventions but very many of other countries registering devices devices for recording fares and money have employed the keenest wits of many inventors and is an art of quite recent origin attention was first directed to fare registers in public vehicles the object of which is to accurately report to the proper office of the company at the end of a trip or of the day the number of passengers carried and the fares received portable registers to be carried by the conductor and operated in front of the passenger have been almost universally succeeded by stationary ones set up at one end of the vehicle in open view of all the passengers and operated by a strap and lever by the conductor these fare registers have been called a mechanical conscience for street car conductors cash registers intended to compel honesty on the part of retail salesmen are required to be operated by them and when the proper lever or levers or it may be a crank handle is or are touched the machine automatically records the amount of the sale the amount of change given and the total amount of all the sales and money received and paid out voting machines 
designed to overcome the difficulties expenditure of time and the commission of errors and frauds experienced in the reading and counting of votes have received great attention from inventors and are not yet in a satisfactory condition the problem involves the dispensing of printing the ballots the prevention of fraudulent deposition of ballots the automatic correct counting of the same and a display of the result as soon as the balloting is closed successful electrical devices have been made for recording the votes of a great number of persons in a large assembly by the touch of an a or nay button at the seat of the voter and the recording of the same on paper at a central desk the invention and extensive use of bicycles automobiles etc have given rise to the invention of cyclometers which are small devices connected to some part of the vehicle to indicate to the rider or driver the rate at which he is riding and the number of miles ridden speed indicators many municipalities having adopted ordinances limiting the rate of speed for street and steam cars bicycles automobiles and other vehicles a want was created which has been met for devices to indicate to the passengers drivers or conductors the rate at which the vehicle is travelling and to sound an alarm in case of excess of speed so that brakes can be applied and the speed reduced or to relieve patrons of anxiety and trouble in this respect ingenious devices have been contrived which automatically reduce the speed when the prescribed limit has been exceeded weighing scales and machines just balances and just weights have been required from the day of the declaration a false weight is an abomination unto the lord and therefore strict accuracy must always be the measure of merit of a weighing machine to this standard the inventions of the century in weighing scales have come until this century the ordinary balance with equal even arms suspended from a central point and each carrying means for suspending articles to be weighed or compared in weights and the later steel yard with its unequal arms with its graduated long arms and a sliding weight and holding pan were the principal forms of weighing machines platform scales were described in an english patent to one salmon in seventeen ninety six but their use is not recorded the compound lever scale on the principle of the steel yard but arranged to be used with a platform was invented and came into use in the United States about 1831. Tadeus and Erastus Fairbanks of St. Johnsbury, Vermont, were the inventors, and it was found to meet the want of farmers in weighing hemp, hay, etc., by more convenient means than the ordinary steel yard. They converted the steel yard into platform scales. The leading characteristics of such machines are, first, a convenient platform nicely balanced on knife edges of steel levers and second a graduated horizontal beam a sliding weight thereon connected by an upright rod at one end to the beam and at its opposite end to the balance frame beneath the platform the modification in size and adaptation of this machine for the weighing of different commodities amounted to some four hundred different varieties running from the delicately constructed apparatus for weighing the fraction of a grain to the ponderous machines for weighing and recording the loaded freight car of fifty or sixty tons or the canal boat or other vessel with its load of five or six hundred tons the adaptation of a balance platform on which to place a light load or to drive thereon with heavy loads whether of horses steam or water vehicles was a great blessing to mankind no wonder that they were soon sold all over the world and that monarchs and people hastened to heap honors on the inventors spring weighing scales have recently been invented which will accurately and automatically show not only the weight but the total price of the goods weight the price per unit being known and fixed in the weighing of large masses of coarse material such as grain coal cotton seed and the like machines have been constructed which automatically weigh such materials and at the same time register the weight 
previous to this century no method was known except the exercise of good judgment in the light of experience of accurately testing the strength of materials wood and metals were used in unnecessarily cumbrous forms for the purpose to which they were put in order to ensure safety or else the strength of the parts failed where it was most needed the idea of testing the tensile transverse and cubical resisting strength of materials has been applied to many other objects than beams and bars of wood and metals to belts cloths cables wires fibers paper twine yarn cement and to liquid Giraldi, kennedy and others of england Thomasset of france richle of germany and fairbanks thurston and emery of the united states are among the noted inventors of such machines in the emery system of machines consisting of scales gauges and dynamometers the power exerted on the material tested is transmitted from the load to an indicating device by means of liquid acting on diaphragms the same principle is employed in his weighing machines by one of these hydraulic testing machines the tensile strength of forged links has been ascertained by the exertion of a power amounting to over seven hundred thousand pounds before breaking a link the chain breaking with a loud report the most delicate materials are tested by the same machine the tensile strength of a horse hair some of which are found to stand the strain of one and two pounds eggs and nuts are cracked without being crushed and the power exerted and the strain endured automatically recorded steel beams and rods have been subjected to a strain of a million pounds before breaking governments municipalities and the people generally are thus provided with means by which they can proceed with the greatest confidence in the safe and economical construction and completion of their buildings and public works end of section 26section 27 of inventions in the century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle. Music, Acoustics, Optics, Fine Arts. Neither the historic nor prehistoric records find man without musical instruments of some sort. They are as old as religion, and have been found wherever evidence of religious rites of any description have been found as they constituted part of the instrumentalities of such rites. They are found as relics of worship and the dance, ages after the worshippers and the dancers have become part of the earth's strata. They have been found wherever the earliest civilizations have been discovered, and they appear to have been regarded as desirable and necessary as the weapons and the labour implements of those civilizations. They abounded in China, in India, and in Egypt before the lyre of Apollo was invented, or the charming harp of Orpheus was conceived. There was little melody, according to modern standards, but the musical instruments, like all other inventions, the fruit of the brain of man, were slowly evolved as he wanted them, and to meet the conditions surrounding him. There were the conch-shell trumpet, the stone, bone, wood, and metal dance rattles, the beaks of birds, and the horns and teeth of beasts for the same rattling purpose, the simple reed pipes, the hollow wooden drums, the skin drum heads, the stretched strings of fibre and of tendons, the flutes, the harps, the guitars, the psalteries, and hundreds of other forms of musical instruments, varied as the skill and fancy of man varied, and in accordance with their taste and wants, along the entire gamut of noises and rude melodies. The ancient races had the instruments, but their voices, except as they existed in the traditions of their gods, were not harmonious. As modern wants and tastes developed and music became a science, the demands of the 18th century were met by A. Helmholtz, who discovered and explained the laws of harmony, and by many ingenious manufacturers, who so revolutionized the pianoforte action and the action of musical instruments constructed on these principles that their predecessors would scarcely be recognized as prototypes. The story of the piano, that queen of musical instruments, involves the whole history of the art of music. 
is evolution from the ancient harp, gleaned by man from the wind. That grand old harper who smote his thunder harp of pines is too long a story to hear recite in detail. It must suffice to say that it started with the harp in its simplest form, composed of a frame with animal tendons stretched tight thereon and twanged by the fingers. Then followed strings of varied length, size, and tension to obtain different tones, soon accompanied by an instrument called the plectrum, a bone or ivory stick with which to vibrate the strings to save the fingers. This was the harp of the Egyptians and of Jubal, the father of all such as handle the harp and the organ, and the half-brother of Tubal Cain, the great teacher of every artificer in brass and iron. Then the harp was laid prostrate, its strings stretched over a sounding board, and each held and adapted to be tightened by pegs, and played upon by little hammers having soft pellets or corks at their ends. This was the psaltery, and the dulcimer of the Assyrians and the Hebrews. The Greeks derived their musical instruments from the Egyptians, and the Romans borrowed theirs from the Greeks, but neither the Greeks nor the Romans invented any. Then, after fourteen or fifteen centuries, we find the harp, both in a horizontal and an upright position, with its strings played upon by keys. This was the clavicitherium. In the sixteenth century came the virginal and the spinet, those soft, tinkling instruments favoured by Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary, and which, recently brought from obscurity, have been made to revive the ancient Elizabethan melodies to the delight of modern hearers. These were followed in the seventeenth century by the clavichord, the favourite instrument of Bach. Then appeared the harpsichord, a still nearer approach to the piano, having a hand or knee-worked pedal, and on which Mozart and Handel and Haydn brought out their grand productions. The ancient Italian cembalo was another spinet. Thus, through the centuries, these instruments have slowly grown. By 1711, in Italy, under the inventive genius of Bartolomeo Cristofori of Florence, they had culminated in the modern piano. The piano, as devised by him, differed from the instruments preceding it chiefly in this, that in the latter the strings were vibrated by striking and pulling on them by pieces of quills attached to levers and operated by keys, whereas in the piano there were applied hammers in place of quills. In the 1876 exhibition at Philadelphia, a piano was displayed which had been made by Johannes Christian Schreiber of Germany in 1741. Then, in the latter part of the 18th century, Broadwood and Clementi of London and Erard of Strasbourg and Petzold of Paris commenced the manufacture of their fine instruments. Erard particularly made many improvements in that and in the 19th century in the piano, its hammers and keys, and Southall of Dublin in the dampers. By them and the Collards of London, Beckstein of Berlin, and Chickering, Steinway, Weber, Schumacher, Decker, and Narba of America was the piano ripened after the lapse of more than two thousand years into the perfectness of the magnificent instruments of modern times, with their better materials, more exact appliances, finer adjustments, greater strength of parts, increase of compass and power, elastic responsiveness of touch, enlarged sonority, satisfying delicacy, and singing character in tone. A piano comprises five principal parts. First, the framing. Second, the sounding board. Third, the stringing. Fourth, the key mechanism or action. And fifth, the ornamental case. To supply these several parts, separate classes of skilled artisans have arisen. The forests have been ransacked for their choicest woods. The mines have been made to yield their choicest stores, and the forge to weld its finest work. Science has given to music the ardent devotion of a lover and resolved a confused mass of more or less pleasant noises into liquid harmonies. In 1862 appeared Helmholtz's great work on the law and tones and the theory of music. He it was who invented the method of analysing sound. By the use of hollow bodies called resonators, he found that every sound, as it generally occurs in nature, and as it is produced by most of our musical instruments, or the human voice, is not a single simple sound but a compound of several tones of different intensity and pitch, all of which different tones combined are heard as one, and that the difference of quality or timbre of the sounds of different musical instruments resides in the different composition of these sounds. 
that different compound sounds contain the same fundamental tone, but differently mixed with other tones. He explained how these fundamental and compound tones might be fully developed to produce either harmonious or dissonant sensations. His researches were carried farther and added to by Professor Mayer of New Jersey. These theories were practically applied in the pianos produced by the celebrated firm of Steinway and Sons of New York, and their inventions and improvements in the iron framing, in laying of strings in relation to the centre of the sounding board, in resonators and upright frames, and in other features, from 1866 to 1876, produced a revolution in the art of piano making. If the piano is properly the queen of musical instruments, the organ may be rightly regarded, as it has been named, king in the realm of music. It is an instrument, the notes of which are produced by the rush of air through pipes of different lengths, the air being supplied by bellows or other means, and controlled by valves which are operated by keys, and by which the supply of air is admitted or cut off. The earliest description appears to be that in the Spiritalia of Hero of Alexandria, 150 to 200 BC, and Ctesibius of Alexandria was the inventor. A series of pipes of varying lengths were filled by an air pump which was operated by a windmill. Organs were again originated in the early Christian centuries, and a Greek epigram of the 4th century refers to one as provided with reeds of a new species agitated by blasts of wind that rush from a leathern cavern beneath their roots, while a robust mortal, running with swift fingers over the concordant keys, makes them smoothly dance and emit harmonious sounds. The same in principle today, but more complicated in structure, yet of easy control under the hands of experts, fertile and varied symphonious effects, giving with equal and satisfying success the gentlest and most sympathetic tones as well as complete and sublimely full utterances of musical inspiration. The improvements of the century have consisted in adding a great variety of stops, in connections and couplers of the great keyboard and pipes, and the pedal part, in the construction of the pipes and wind chests, and principally in the adaptation of steam, water, air, and electricity, in place of the muscles of men, as powers in furnishing the supply of air. Some of the great organs of the century, having three or four thousand pipes, with all the modern improvements, and combining great power with the utmost brilliancy and delicacy of utterance, and with a blended effect which is grand, solemn, and most impressive, render indeed this noble instrument the king in the realm of music. In the report of 1895 of the United States Commissioner of Patents, it is stated that the auto-harp has been developed within the last few years, having bars arranged transversely across the strings and provided with dampers which, when depressed, silence all the strings except those producing the desired chords. An ingenious musical instrument of the class, having keyboards like the piano or organ, has been recently invented. All keyboard instruments in ordinary use produce tones that are only approximately correct in pitch, because these must be limited in number to twelve, to the octave, while the tones of the violin are absolute and untempered. The improved instrument produces untempered tones without requiring extraordinary variations from the usual arrangement of the keys. Self-playing musical instruments have been known for more than forty years but it is within the past 25 years that devices have been invented for controlling tones by pneumatic or electrical appliances to produce expressions. Examples of the later of these three kinds of musical instruments may be found in the United States patents of Zimmerman in 1882, Tanaka 1890, and Galley 1879. The science of acoustics and its practical applications have greatly advanced chiefly due to the researches of Helmholtz referred to above. When the nature and laws of the waves of sound became fully known, a great field of inventions was opened. Then came the telephone, phonograph, graphophone, and gramophone. The telephone depends upon a combination of electricity and the waves of the human voice. The phonograph and its modifications depend alone on sound waves. The recording of the waves from one vibrating membrane and their exact reproduction on another vibrating membrane. The acoustic properties of churches and other buildings were improved by the adaptation of banks of fine wires to prevent the re-echoing of sounds. Auricular tubes adapted to be applied to the ears and concealed by the hair and other forms of oral instruments were devised. The megaphone of Edison appeared, 
consisting of two large funnels having elastic conducting tubes from their apices to the oral orifice. Conversation in moderate tones has been heard and understood by their use at a distance of one and a half miles. The megaphone has been found very useful in speaking to large outdoor crowds. But let us go back a little. In 1845, Charles Bousset of France published the idea that the vibrations of speech uttered against a diaphragm might break or make an electric contact, and the electric pulsations thereby produced might set another diaphragm vibrating which should produce the transmitted sound waves. In 1857, another Frenchman, Leon Scott, patented in France his phonautograph, an instrument consisting of a large barrel-like mouthpiece into which words were spoken, a membrane therein against which the voice vibrations were received, a stylus attached to this vibrating membrane, and a rotating cylinder covered with blackened paper, against which the stylus bore, and on which it recorded the sound waves in exact form received on the vibrating diaphragm. Then came the researches and publications of Helmholtz and Koenig on acoustic science, 1862-1866. Then young Philip Reiss of Frankfurt, Germany, attempted to put all these theories into an apparatus to reproduce speech, but did not quite succeed. Then in 1874 to 1875, Bell took up the matter, and at the Philadelphia Exhibition, 1876, astonished the world by the revelations of the telephone. In April 1877, Charles Croce, a Frenchman, in a communication to the Academy of Science in Paris, after describing an apparatus like the Scott phonautograph, set forth how traced undulating lines of voice vibrations might be reproduced in intaglio, or in relief, and reproduced upon a vibrating membrane by a pointed stylus attached thereto, and following the line of the original pulsations. The communication seems to have been pigeonholed and not read in open session until December 1877, and until after Thomas A. Edison had actually completed and used his phonograph in the United States. Cross rested on the suggestion. Edison, without knowing of Cross's suggestion, was first to make and actually use the same invention. Edison's cylinder, on which the sounds were recorded and from which they were reproduced, was covered by tinfoil. A great advance was made by Dr. Chichester A. Bell and Mr. C. S. Tainter, who in 1886 patented in the United States means of cutting or engraving the sound waves in a solid body. The solid body they employed was a thin pasteboard cylinder covered with wax. This apparatus they called the graphophone. Two years thereafter, Mr. Emil Berliner of Washington had invented the gramophone, which consists in etching on a metallic plate the record of voice waves. He has termed his invention the art of etching the human voice. He prepares a polished metal plate, generally zinc, with an extremely thin coating of film or fatty milk, which dries upon and adheres to the plate. The stylus penetrates this film, meeting from it the slightest possible resistance, and traces thereon the message. The record plate is then subjected to a particularly constituted acid bath, which, entering the groove or grooves formed by the stylus, cuts or etches the same into the plate. The groove thus formed may be deepened by another acid solution. When thus produced, as many copies of the record as desired may be made by the electrotyper or print plater. The public is now familiar with the different forms of this wonderful instrument, and like the telephone they no longer seem marvellous. Yet it is only within the age of a youth or a maiden when the allegations or predictions that the human voice would soon be carried over the land and reproduced across a continent, or be preserved or engraven on tablets and reproduced at pleasure anywhere, in this or any subsequent generation, were themselves regarded as strange messages of dreamers and madmen. Optical Instruments There were practical inventions and optical instruments long before this century, achromatic and other lenses were known, and the microscope, the telescope, and spectacles. The inventive genius of this century in the field of optics has not eclipsed the telescope and microscope of former ages. They were the fruits of the efforts of many ages and of many minds, although Hans Lippisheim of Holland in 1608 
appears to have made the first successful instrument for seeing things at a distance. Galileo soon thereafter greatly improved and increased its capacity, and was the first to direct it towards the heavens. And as to the microscope, Dr. Liebeklum of Berlin in 1740 made the first successful solar microscope. As well known, it consisted essentially of two lenses and a mirror, by which the sun's rays were reflected on the first lens, concentrated on the object, and further magnified by the second lens. The depths of the stars and the minutest moat that floats in the sunbeam reflect the glory of those inventions. The invention of John Dolland of London, about 1758, of the achromatic lens, should be borne in mind in connection with telescopes, microscopes, etc. He it was who invented the combination of two lenses, one concave and the other convex, one of flint glass and the other of crown glass, which, refracting in contrary ways, neutralized the dispersion of color rays and produced a clear, colorless light. Many improvements and discoveries in optics and optical instruments have been made during the century, due to the researches of such scientists as Arago, Brewster, Young, Fresnel, Airy, Hamilton, Lloyd, Kochi, and others, and of the labors of the army of skilled experts and mechanicians who have followed their lead. Sir David Brewster, born in Scotland in 1781, made, 1810 to 1840, many improvements in the construction of the microscope and telescope, invented the kaleidoscope, introduced in the stereoscope the principles and leading features which those beautiful instruments still embody, and rendered it popular among scientists and artists. It is said that Professor Elliot of Edinburgh in 1834 was the first to conceive of the idea of a stereoscope by which two different pictures of the same object, taken by photography, to correspond to the two different positions of an object as viewed by the two eyes, were combined into one view by two reflecting mirrors set at an angle of about 45 degrees, and conveying to the eyes a single reflection of the object as a solid body. But Sir Charles Wheaton, in 1838, constructed the first instrument, and in 1849, Brewster introduced the present form of lenticular lenses. Brewster also demonstrated the utility of dioptric lenses and zones in lighthouse illumination, and in which field Faraday and Tyndall also subsequently worked with the addition of electrical appliances. The labours of these three men have illuminated the wildest waters of the sea and preserved a thousand fleets of commerce and of war from awful shipwreck. As illustrating the difficulty sometimes encountered in introducing an invention into use, the American Journal of Chemistry some years ago related that the Abbe Moigno, in introducing the stereoscope to the savants of France, first took it to Arago, but Arago had a defect of vision which made him see double, and he could only see in it a medley of four pictures. Then the Abbe went to Savart, but unfortunately Savart had but one eye and was quite incapable of appreciating the thing. Then Becquerel was next visited, but he was nearly blind and could see nothing in the new optical toy. Not discouraged, the abbé then called upon Pouillet of the Conservatoire des Arts et Métiers. Pouillet was much interested, but he was troubled with a squint which presented to his anxious gaze but a blurred mixture of images. Lastly, Brot was tried. Brot believed in the corpuscular theory of light, and was opposed to the undulatory theory, and the good abbé, not being able to assure him that the instrument did not contradict his theory, Brot refused to have anything to do with it. In spite, however, of the physical disabilities of scientists, the stereoscope finally made its way in France. Besides increasing the power of the eye to discover the secrets and beauties of nature, modern invention has turned upon the eye itself, and displayed the wonders existing there behind its dark glass doors. It was Helmholtz who, in 1851, described his ophthalmoscope, he arranged a candle so that its rays of light falling on an inclined reflector were thrown through the pupil of the patient's eye, whose retina reflected the image received on the retina back to the mirror where it could be viewed by the observer. This image was the background of the eye, and its delicate blood vessels and tissues could thus be observed. This instrument was improved, and it gave rise to the contrivance of many delicate surgical instruments for operating on the eye. The spectroscope is an instrument by which the colours of the solar rays are separated and viewed, 
as well as those of other incandescent bodies. By it, not only the elements of the heavenly bodies have been determined, but remarkable results have been had in analysing well-known metals and discovering new ones. Its powers and its principles have been so developed during the century by the discoveries, inventions and investigations of Herschel, Wollaston, Fraunhofer, Bronson and Kirchhoff, Steinheil, Tyndall, Huggins, Draper and others, that spectrum analysis has grown from the separation of light into its colours by the prism of Newton to what Dr. Huggins has aptly termed a new sense. We have further referred to this wonderful discovery in the chapter on chemistry. The inventions and improvements in optical instruments gave rise to great advances in the making of lenses based on scientific principles and not resting alone on hard work and experience. Alvin Clark, son of America, and Professor Ernst Abbe of Germany have within the last third of the century produced a revolution in the manufacture of lenses and thereby extended the realms of knowledge to new worlds of matter in the heavens and on earth. Solar meter. In 1895, a United States patent was granted to Mr. Beckler for an instrument called a solar meter. It is designed for taking observations of heavenly bodies and recording mechanically the parts of the astronomical triangle used in navigation and light work. Its chief purpose is to determine the position of the compass error of a ship at sea independently of the visibility of the sea horizon. If the horizon is clouded and the sun or a known star is visible, the ship's position can still be determined by the solar meter. Instruments for measuring the position and distances of unseen objects. Some of the latest of such instruments will enable one to see and shoot at an object around a corner, or at least out of sight. Thus the United States patent was granted to Fisk in 1889, wherein it is set forth that by stationing observers at points distant from a gun, which points are at the extremities of a known baseline, and which command a view of the area within the range of the gun, the observers discover the position and range of the object by triangulation and set certain pointers. By means of an electrical connection between those pointers and pointers at the gun station, based on the system of the Wheatstone Bridge, the latter pointers, or the guns themselves serving as pointers, may be placed in position to indicate the line of fire. By a nice arrangement of mirror and lenses attached to the firearm, the same object may be accomplished. Similar apparatuses, in which the reflectory surfaces of mirrors mounted on an elevated framework, and known as polemoscopes and ultoscopes and rangefinders, have also been invented and used with artillery. But such devices may be profitably used for more peaceful and amusing purposes. Born with the ear attuned to music and the eye to observe beauty, the hand of art was to trace and make permanent the fleeting forms which melody and the eye impressed upon the soul of man. In fact, modern science has demonstrated that tones and colours are inseparable. Bell and Tainter, with their photophone, have converted the undulatory waves of light into the sweetest music. Reversing the process, beautiful flashes of light have been produced from musical vibrations by the photophote of Monsieur Coulon and the phonoscope of Henry Edmonds. Entrancing as the story is, we can only here allude to a few of those discoveries and inventions that have become the handmaidens of the art which guided the chisel of Phidias and inspired the brush of Raphael. Photography the art of producing permanent images of the human face divine, natural scenes and other objects by the agency of light, is due more to the discoveries of the chemist than to the inventions of the mechanic, and to the chemists of the century. At the same time, the mechanical invention of old times became a necessary appliance in the reduction of the theories of the chemists to practice. The camera obscura, that dark box in which a mirror is placed, provided also with a piece of ground glass or white cardboard paper, and having a projecting part at one end in which a lens is placed, whereby, when the lens part is directed to an object, an image of the same is thrown by the rays of light focused by the lens upon the mirror, and reflected by the mirror to the glass or paper board, was invented by Roger Bacon about 1297, or by Alberta in 1437, Described by Leonardo da Vinci in 1500 as an imitation of the structure of the eye, again by Baptiste de Porta in 1589, 
and remodelled by Sir Isaac Newton in 1700. Until the 19th century, it was used only in the taking of sketches and scenes on or from the card or glass on which the reflection was thrown. Celebrated chemists such as Scheele of the 18th century and Ritter, Wollaston, Sir Humphrey Davy, Young, Gay-Lussac, Thénard, and others in the early part of the 19th century began to turn their attention to the chemical and molecular changes which the sunlight and its separate rays effected in certain substances, and especially upon certain compounds of silver. In sensitizing the receiving paper, glass, or metal with such a compound, it must necessarily be protected from exposure to sunlight. And this fact, together with the desire to sensitize the image produced by the camera, not only suggested, but seemed to render that instrument indispensable to photography. Nevertheless, the experiments of chemists fell short of a high mark, and it was reserved for an artist to unite the efforts of the sun and the chemists in a successful instrument. It was Louis-Jacques Mondet Daguerre, born at Corneille, France, in 1789, and who died in 1851, who was the first to reduce to practice the invention called after his name. He was a brilliant scene painter, and especially successful in painting panoramas. In 1822, assisted by Buton, he had invented the diorama, by which coloured lights representing the various changes of the day and season were thrown upon the canvases in his beautiful panoramas of Rome, London, Naples and other great cities. And several years previous to 1839, he and Josef N. Nippis, learning of the efforts of chemists in that line, began independently, and then together, to develop the art of obtaining permanent copies of objects produced by the chemical action of the sun. Nepitz died while they were thus engaged. De Geer prosecuted his researches alone, and towards the close of 1838 his success was such that he made known his invention to Arago, and Arago announced it in an eloquent and enthusiastic address to the French Academy of Sciences in January 1839. It had once excited great attention which was heightened by the pictures produced by the new process. The French government, in consideration of the details of the invention and its improvements being made public, and on request of de Geer, granted him an annuity, and also one to Nepice's son. At first, only pictures of natural objects were taken, but in learning of de Geer's process, Dr. John William Draper of New York, a native of England and adopted son of America, the brilliant author of The Intellectual Development of Europe, and other great works, in the same year, 1839, took portraits of persons by photography, and he was the first to do this. Draper was also the first in America to reveal the wonders of the spectroscope, and he was the first to show that each colour of the spectrum had its own peculiar chemical effect. This was in 1847. The sun was now fairly harnessed in the service of man in the new great art of photography. Natural philosophers, chemists, inventors, mechanics all now pressed forward, and still press forward to improve the art, to establish new growth from the old art, and extend its domains. Those domains have the generic term of photoprocessors. De Geurotypy, while the father of them all, is now hardly practised as de Geur practised it, and has become a small subordinate subdivision of the great class. Yet more faithful likenesses are not yet produced than by this now old process. Among the children of the photoprocess family are the calotype, ambrotype, ferrerotype, collodion and silver printing, carbon printing, heliotype, heliogravure, photo engraving, relief and taglia woodbury type, photolithography, albert type, photozincograph, photogelatin printing, photomicrography, to depict microscopic objects, kinetographs, and photosculpture. A world of mechanical contrivances have been invented. Optnometers, baths, burnishing tools, cameras and camera stands, magazine and roll holders, dark rooms and focusing devices, heaters and dryers, exposure meters, etc., etc. The kinetograph, for taking a series of pictures of rapidly moving objects, and by which the living object, person or persons, are made to appear moving before us as they moved when the picture was taken, is a marvellous invention, and yet simple when the process is understood. Photography and printing have combined to revolutionise the art of illustration. 
exact copies of an original, whether of a painting or a photograph, are now produced on paper with all the original shades and colours. The long-sought-for problem of photographing in colours has in a measure been solved. The three-colour processes is the name given to the new offspring of the inventors which reproduces by the camera the natural colours of objects. The scientists Maxwell Young and Helmholtz established the theory that the three colours, red, green and blue, were the primary colours, and from a mixture of these, secondary colours are produced. Henry Collin, in 1865, laid down the lines on which the practical reduction should take place, and within the last decade, F. E. Ives of Philadelphia has invented the photochromoscope for producing pictures in their natural colours. The process consists in blending in one picture the separate photographic views taken on separate negative plates, each sensitised to receive one of the primary colours, which are then exposed and blended simultaneously in a triple camera. Plates and films and many other articles and processes have helped to establish the art of photography on its new basis. Among the minor inventions relating to art, mention may be made of that very useful article, the lead pencil, which all have employed so much time in sharpening to the detriment of time and clean hands. Within a decade, pencils in which the lead or crayon is covered instead of with wood, with slitted, perforated or creased paper, spirally rolled thereon, and on which, by unrolling a portion at a time, a new point is exposed, or that other style in which a number of short, sharpened marking leads or crayons are arranged in series and adapted to be projected one after the other as fast as worn away. In painting, modern inventions and discoveries have simply added to the instrumentalities of genius, but have created no royal road to the art made glorious by Titian and Raphael. It has given to the artists, through its chemists, a world of new colours, and through its mechanics, new and convenient appliances. Airbrushes have proved a great help by which the paint or other colouring matter is sprayed in heavy, light or almost invisible showers to produce backgrounds by the force of air blown upon the pigments held in drops at the end of a fine spraying tube. Made of larger proportions, this brush has been used for fresco painting, for painting large objects, such as buildings, which it admits of doing with great rapidity. A description of modern methods of applying colours to porcelain and pottery is given in the chapter treating of those subjects. Telegraphic pictures. Perhaps it is appropriate in closing this chapter that reference be made to that process by which the likeness of the distant reader may be taken telegraphically. A picture in relief is first made by the swelled gelatin or other process. A tracing point is then moved in the lines across the undulating surface of the pictures, and the movements of this tracer are imparted by suitable electrical apparatus to a cutter or engraving tool at the opposite end of the line, and there reproduced upon a suitable substance. End of section 27. Section 28 of Inventions in the Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Prajakta. Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle. Chapter 27 Safes and Locks. Prior to the century, safes were not constructed to withstand the test of intense heat. Efforts were numerous, however, to render them safe against the entrance of thieves, but the ingenuity of the thieves advanced more rapidly than the ingenuity of safe makers, and the race between these two classes of inventors still continues. For with the exercise of a vast amount of ingenuity in intricate locks, aided by all the advancement of science as to the nature of metals, their tough manufacture and their resistance to explosives, thieves still manage to break in and steal. The only sure protection against burglars at the close of the 19th century appears to consist of what it was at the close of any previous century the preponderance of physical force and the best weapons. 
Among the latest inventions are electrical connections with the safe, whereby tampering therewith alarms one or more watchmen at a near station. A classification of safes embraces fireproof, burglar proof, safe bolt works, express and deposit safes and boxes, circular doors, pressure mechanism, and water and air protective devices. The attention of the earliest inventors of the century were directed toward making safes fireproof. In England, the first patent granted for the fireproof safe was to Richard Scott in 1801. It had two casings, an inner and outer one, including the door, and the interspace was filled in with charcoal or wood and treated with a solution of alkaline salt. This idea of interspacing filled in with non-combustible material has been generally followed ever since. The particular inventions in that line consist in the discovery and appliance of new lining materials, variations in the form of the interspacing, and new methods in the construction of the casings and the selection of the best metals for such construction. In 1834, William Marr of England patented a lining for a double metallic chest filled with non-combustible materials such as mica or talc clay, lime and graphite. Asbestos commenced to be used about the same time. The Great Fire in New York City in 1835, destroying hundreds of billions of dollars worth of property of every description, gave a great impetus to the invention of fireproof safes in America. B. G. Wilder, their patent in 1843, his celebrated safe, now extensively used throughout the world. It consisted of a double box of wrought iron plates strengthened at the edges with bar iron, with a bar across the middle, and as a filling for the interspaces, he used hydrated gypsum, hydraulic cement, plaster of Paris, steatite, alum, and the dried residuum of soda water. Herring was another American who invented celebrated safes, made with a boiler iron exterior, a hardened steel inner safe, with the interior filled with a casting of franklinite around rods of soft steel. Thus, the earth, air, and water were ransacked for lining materials, in some cases more for the purpose of obtaining a patent than to accomplish any real advance in the art. Water itself was introduced as a lining made to flow through the safes, sometimes from the city mains, and so retained that when the temperature in case of fire reached 212 degree Fahrenheit, it became steam and an arrangement for introducing steam in place of water was contrived. Among other lining materials found suitable were soapstone, alumina, ammonia, copper ash, starch, ipsum salt and gypsum, paper, pulp and alum and a mixture of various other materials. After safes were produced that would come out of fiery furnaces where they had been buried for days without even the smell of fire or smoke upon their contents, inventors commenced to direct their attention to burglar-proof safes. Cup, in 1835, patented a process of rendering wooden safes burglar-proof by lining them with steel or case-hardened iron plate. Newton, in 1853, produced one made of an outer shell of cast iron, an interior network of wrought iron rods and fluid iron poured between these so that a compound mass was formed of different degrees of resistance to turn aside the burglar's tools. Cup again in 1857 and in subsequent years and Chartwood, Glocker and Thompson and Tan and others in England invented new forms to prevent the insertion of wedges and the drilling by tools. Hall and Marvin of the United States also invented safes for the same purpose. Hall had thick steel plates, dovetailed together and angle irons tenoned at the corners. 
Marvin's safe was globe shaped to present no salient points for the action of tools made of chrome steel mounted in this shape on a platform or enclosed in a fireproof safe. Herring also invented a safe in which he hinged and grooved the doors with double casings and which he hung with a lever hinge, provided the doors with separate locks and packed all the joints with rubber to prevent the operation of the air pump, which had become a dangerous device of burglars with which to introduce explosives to blow open the doors. Still later and more elaborate means have been used to frustrate the burglars. Electricity has been converted into an automatic warder to guard the castle and the safe and to give an alarm to convenient stations when the locks or doors are meddled with and the proper manipulation not used. Express safes for railroad cars have been made of parts telescoped or crowded together by hydraulic power requiring heavy machinery for locking and unlocking and this machinery is located in machine shops along the route and not accessible to burglars. About 1815, inventors commenced to produce devices to show with certainty if a lock had been tampered with. The keyhole was closed by a revolving metallic curtain and paper was secured over the keyhole. As a further means of detection, photographs of some irregular object are made one of which is placed over the keyhole and the other is retained. This prevents the substitution of one piece of paper for another piece without detection. A large number of patents have been taken out on glass coverings for locks which have to be broken before the lock can be turned. These are called seal locks. Locks of various kinds consisting at least of the two general features of a bolt and a key to move the bolt have existed from very ancient days. The Egyptians, the Hebrews and the Chinese and Oriental nations generally had locks and keys of ponderous size. Isaiah speaks of the key of the house of David and Homer writes sonorously of the lock in the house of Penelope with its brazen key, the respondent wards, the flying bars and the valves which Loud as a bull makes hills and valley ring, so roared the lock when it released the spring. The castles, churches and convents of the Middle Ages had their often highly ornamental locks and their warders to guard and open them. Later, locks were invented with complex wards. These are carved pieces of metal in the lock which fit into clefts or grooves in the key and prevent the lock from being opened except by its own proper key. As early as 1650, the Dutch had invented the later lock, the progenitor of the modern permutation lock consisting of a lock, the bolt of which is surrounded by several rings on which were cut the letters of the alphabet, which by a pre-arrangement on the part of the owner were made to spell a certain word or number of words before the lock could be opened. Kerio, in verses written in 1621, refers to one of these locks as follows. As dot a lock that goes with letters, for till everyone be known, the locks as fast as though you had found none. The art had also advanced in the 18th century to the use of tumblers in locks, the lever or latch or plate which falls into the notch of the bolt and prevents it from being shot until it has been raised or released by the action of the key. Baron in England in 1778 obtained a patent for such a lock. Joseph Brahma, who has before been referred to in connection with the hydraulic press he invented, also in 1784 invented and patented in England a lock which obtained a worldwide reputation and a century's extensive use. It was the first or among the first of locks which troubled modern burglar's picks. Its leading features were a key with longitudinal slots, a barrel enclosing a spring, plates called sliders, 
notched unequally and resting against the spring, a plate with a central perforation and slits leading therefrom to engage the notches of the slides simultaneously and allow the frame to be turned by the key so as to actuate the bolt. Chubb and Hobbs of England made important improvements in tumbler locks which for a long time were regarded as unpickable. Most important advances have been made during the century in combination or permutation locks and time locks. For a long time, permutation or combination locks consisted of modifications of one general principle and that was the Dutch later lock already referred to or the wheel lock composed of a series of discs with letters around their edges. The interior arrangement is such as to prevent the bolt being shot until a series of letters were in line, forming a combination known only to the operator. Time locks are constructed on the principle of clockwork so that they cannot be opened even with the proper key until a regulated interval of time has elapsed. Among the most celebrated combination and time locks of the century are those known as the Yale locks, chiefly the inventions of Louis Yale Jr. of Philadelphia. The Yale double dial lock is a double combination bank or safe lock having two dials, each operating its own set of tumblers and bolts so that two persons, each in possession of his own combination, must be present at a certain time in order to unlock it. If this double security is not desired, one person alone may be possessed of both combinations or the combinations may be set as one. In their time locks, a safe can be set so as to not only render it impossible to unlock except at a predetermined time each day, but the arrangement is such that on intervening Sundays, the time mechanism will entirely prevent the operation of the lock or the opening of the door on that day. Another feature of the lock is the thin flat keys with bevel aged notchings or with longitudinal sinuous corrugations to fit a narrow slit of a cylinder lock. To make locks for use with the corrugated keys, machines of as great ingenuity as the locks were devised. In such a lock, the keyhole, which is a little very narrow slit, is formed sinuously to correspond to the sinuosities of the key. No other key will fit it, nor can it be picked by a tool, as the tool must be an exact duplicate of the key in order to enter and move in the keyhole. Of late years, numerous locks have been invented for the special uses to which they are to be applied. Thus, one type of lock is that for safety deposit vaults and boxes in which a primary key in the keeping of a janitor operates alone the tumblers or guard mechanism to set the lock, while the box owner may be use a secondary key to completely unlock the box or vault. Master or secondary key locks are now in common use in hotels and apartment houses by which the key of the door held by a guest will unlock only his door but the master key held by the manager or janitor will unlock all the doors. This saves the duplication and multiplicity of a vast number of extra keys. The value of a simple, cheap, safe, effective lock in a place where its advantages are appreciated by all classes of people everywhere is illustrated in the application of the modern rotary registering lock to the single article of mail bags. Formerly, it was not unusual that losses by theft of mail matter were due in part to the extraction of a portion of the mail matter by unlocking or removing the lock and then restoring it in place. The United States, with its 76 million of people, found it necessary to use in its mail service hundreds of thousands of mail pouches having locks for securing packages of valuable matter. But these locks are of such character 
that it is impossible for anyone to break into the bag and conceal the evidence of his crime. The unfortunate thief is reduced to the necessity of stealing the whole pouch. Losses under this system have grown so small as to be almost incapable of mathematical calculation. Safe and convenient locks for so very many purposes are now so common even to prevent the unauthorized use of an umbrella or the unfriendly taking away of a bicycle or other vehicle that notwithstanding the 19th century dynamite with which burglars still continue to blow open the best constructed safes and vaults, still a universal sense of greater security in such matters is beginning to manifest itself. And not only the loss of valuables by fire and theft is becoming the exception, but the temptation to steal is being gradually removed. End of section 28. Section 29 of Inventions in the Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle. Carrying Machines the reflecting observer delights occasionally to shift the scenes of the present stage and bring to the front the processions of the past that famous triumphal one for instance of ptolemy of philadelphus at alexandria about two seventy b c then in the midst of his power and glory in which there were chariots and cumbrous wagons drawn by elephants and goats antelopes oryxes buffaloes ostriches gnus and zebras then a tribe of the scythians when with many scores of oxen they were shifting their light big round houses made of felt cloth and mounted on road carts to a new camping place next a wild mad dash of the roman charioteers around the amphitheatre or a triumphal march with chariots of carved ivory bearing aloft the ensigns of victory and now an army of the ancient britons driving through these same charioteers of caesar with their own rude chariots having sharp hooks and crooked iron blades extending from their axles now a lady's chair of the fourteenth century the state carriage of the time with a long wooden roofed and windowed body having a door at each end resting on a cumbrous frame without springs and the axles united rigidly to a long reach next comes a line of imposing clumsy state coaches of the sixteenth century with bodies provided with pillars to support the roof and adorned with curtains of cloth and leather but still destitute of springs and here in stately approach comes a line of more curious and more comfortable royal coaches of the seventeenth century when springs were for the first time introduced and now rumbles forward a line of those famous old english stage coaches originated in the seventeenth century which were two days flying from oxford to london a distance of fifty-five miles but a scene in the next century shows these ponderous vehicles greatly improved and the modern english stage mail coaches of palmer in line referring to palmer's coaches knight says palmer according to de quincey was twice as great a man as galileo because he not only invented mail coaches of more general practical utility than jupiter's satellites but married the daughter of a duke and succeeded in getting the post office to use them this revolutionized the whole business the coaches were built with steel springs windows of great strength and lightness combined 
boots for the baggage seats for a few outside passengers and a guard with a grand uniform to protect the mail and stand for the dignity of his majesty's government by the system of changing horses frequently great speed was attained and the distance from edinburgh to london four hundred miles was made in forty hours other lines of coaches arranged to carry double the number of passengers outside than in fourteen to six were made heavier and took the road more leisurely the carts and conveyances of the poor were cumbrous heavy contrivances without springs mostly two-wheel heavy carts the middle classes at that time were not seen riding in coaches of their own but generally on horseback as the coaches of the rich were too expensive and the conveyances of the poor were too rude in construction and too painful in observation let the observer now pass to the largest and most varied exhibition of the best types of modern vehicles of every description that the world had ever seen the international exhibition at philadelphia in eighteen seventy six and behold what wonderful changes art science invention and mechanical skill had wrought in this domain here were the carriages of the rich constructed of the finest and most appropriate woods that science and experience had found best adapted for the various parts requiring the combination of strength and lightness the best steel for the springs embodying in themselves a world of invention and discovery and splendid finish and polish in all parts unknown to former generations here too were found vehicles of a great variety for the comfort and convenience of every family from the smallest to the largest means the farmer and the truckmen were especially provided for one establishment making an exhibition at that time employed some six hundred or seven hundred hands four hundred horsepower of steam turning out sixty wagons a day or one in every ten minutes of each working day in the year here england showed her victoria her broughams landaus phaetons sporting carts wagonettes drays and dog carts canada her splendid sleighs france her superb barouches carriages double top sociables the celebrated college patent axle trees and springs germany the best carriage axles springs and gears russia its famous low-wheeled fast-running carriages norway its carryalls or sulkies and sleighs strongly built and made of wood from those vast forests that ever abound in strength and beauty one ancient sleigh there was demurely standing by its modern companions said to have been built in sixteen twenty five and it was still good america stood foremost in carriage wheels of best materials and beautiful workmanship bent rims turned and finished spokes mortised hubs steel tires business and farm wagons carts and baby carriages each trade and field of labor had its own especially adapted complete and finished vehicle there were hay wagons and hearses beer wagons and ice carts doctors buggies express wagons drays package delivery wagons peddlers wagons with all the shelves and compartments of a miniature store skeleton wagons and sportsmen's and lighting graceful two and four wheelers beautiful displays of bent and polished woods a splendid array of artistic elegant and useful harnesses 
and all the traps that go to make modern means of conveyance by animal power so cheap convenient strong and attractive that civilization seems to have reached a stop in principles of construction of vehicles and in their materials and since contents itself in improving details to this century is due the development of that class of carriages the generic term for which is velocipedes a word which would imply a vehicle propelled by the feet although it has been applied to vehicles propelled by the hands and steered by the feet this name originated with the french and several frenchmen patented velocipedes from eighteen hundred to eighteen twenty one tricycles having three wheels propelled by the hands and steered with the feet were also invented in the early part of the century the term bicycle does not appear to have been used until about eighteen sixty nine although such structures had been referred to in publications before yet the modern bicycle appears to have been first practically constructed in germany in eighteen sixteen baron von dreis of mannheim made a vehicle consisting of two wheels arranged one before the other and connected by a bar the forward wheel axled in a fork which was swiveled to the front end of the bar and had handles to guide the machine with a seat on the bar midway between the two wheels and arranged so that the driver should bestride the bar but there was no support for the rider's feet and the vehicle was propelled by thrusting his feet alternately against the ground this machine was called the Dicena and undoubtedly was the progenitor of the modern bicycle. Dennis Johnson patented in England in 1818 a similar vehicle which he named the pedestrian curricle. Another style was called the dandy horse. Another form was that of Gompertz in England in 1821 who contrived a segmental rack connected with a frame over the front wheel and engaging a pinion on the wheel axle with some improvements added by others the vehicle came into quite extensive and popular use in some of the cities in europe and america it was also named the dandy and the hobby horse treadles were subsequently applied but after a time the machine fell into disuse and was apparently forgotten in eighteen sixty three however the idea was revived by a frenchman michaud who added the crank to the front wheel axle of the dracaena also called the celery fair in eighteen sixty six pierre lallemand of france having adapted the idea of the crank and pedal movement and obtained a patent went to america where after two years of public indifference the machine suddenly sprang into favor in eighteen sixty nine a popular wave in its favor also spread over part of europe and all classes of people were riding it but the wheels had hard tires the roads and many of the streets were not smooth the vehicle got the name of the bone breaker and its use ceased during the few years following some new styles of frames were invented thus some very high wheels with a small wheel in front or one behind wheels with levers in addition to the crank etc and then for a time the art rested again some one then recalled the fact that macmillan a scotchman about eighteen thirty eight to eighteen forty one had used two low wheels like the dicena with the driving gear and that dalzell also of scotland had in eighteen forty five made a similar machine parts of these old machines were found and the wheel reconstructed 
then in the seventies the entire field was thrown open to women by the invention in england of the drop frame which removed completely the difficulty as to the arrangement of the skirts and thus doubled the interest in and desire for a comfortable riding machine but they were still to a great degree bone breakers then j b dunlop a veterinary surgeon of belfast ireland in order to meet the complaints of his son that the wheel was too hard thought of the pneumatic rubber tire and applied it with great success this was a very notable and original reinvention a reinvention because a man born before his time had invented and patented the pneumatic tire more than forty years before it was not wanted then and everybody had forgotten it this man was robert william thompson a civil engineer of adelphi middlesex county england in eighteen forty five he attained a patent in england and shortly after in the united states in both patents he describes how he proposed to make a tire for all kinds of vehicles consisting of a hollow rubber tube with an intermixed canvas and rubber lining a tube and a screw cup by which to inflate it and several ways for preventing punctures to obviate the bad results of the punctures he proposed also to make his tires in sectional compartments so that if one compartment was punctured the others would still hold good he also proposed to use vulcanized rubber thus utilizing the then very recent discovery of goodyear of mixing sulphur with soft rubber and to apply the same to the canvas lining and now when the last decade of the century had been reached and after a century's hard work by the inventors the present wonderful vehicle known as the safety bicycle had obtained a successful and permanent foothold among the vehicles of mankind proper proportions low wheels chain gearing treadles pedals and cranks cushion and pneumatic tires drop frames steel spokes like a spider's web ball bearings for the crank and axle parts a spring supported cushioned seat which could be raised or lowered adjustable handles and the clearest brained scientific mechanics to construct all the parts from the best materials and with mathematical exactness all this has been done to these accomplishments have been added a great variety of tires to prevent wear and puncturing among which are self-healing tires having a lining of viscous or plastic rubber to close up automatically the air holes many ways of clamping the tire to the rim have been contrived so have brakes of various descriptions some consisting of discs on the driving shaft brought into frictional contact by a touch of the toe on the pedal as a substitute for those applied to the surface of the tire known as spoon brakes saddles speed gearings men's machines in which by the removal of the upper bar the machine is converted into one for the use of women the substitution of the direct action consisting of beveled gearing for the sprocket chain etc etc the ideas of william thompson as to pneumatic and cushioned tires are now after a lapse of fifty years generally adopted even sportsmen were glad to seize upon them and wheels of sulkies provided with the pneumatic tires have enabled them to lower the record of trotting horses their use on many other vehicles has accomplished his objects of lessening the power required to draw carriages rendering the motion easier and diminishing the noise
it is impossible to overlook the fact in connection with this subject that the processes and machinery especially invented to make the various parts of a bicycle are as wonderful as the wheel itself counting the spokes there are it is estimated more than three hundred different parts in such a wheel the best and latest inventions and discoveries in the making of metals wood rubber and leather have been drawn upon in supplying these useful carriers and what a revolution they have produced in the making of good roads the saving of time the dispatch of business and more than all else in the increase of the pleasure the health and the amusement of mankind it was quite natural that when the rubber cushion and pneumatic tires rounded the pleasure of easy and noiseless riding in vehicles that motor vehicles should be revived and improved so we have the automobiles in great variety invention has been and is still being greatly exercised as to the best motive power in the adaption of electric motors oil and gasoline or vapor engines springs and air pumps in attempts to reduce the number of complicated parts and to render less strenuous the mental and muscular strain of the operator traction engines the old road engines that antedated the locomotives are being revived and new ideas springing from other arts are being incorporated in these useful machines to render them more available than in former generations many of the principles and features of motor vehicles but on a heavier scale are being introduced to adapt them to the drawing of far heavier loads late devices comprise a spring link between the power and the traction wheel to prevent too sudden a start and permit a yielding motion steering devices by which the power of the engine is used to steer the machine and application of convenient and easily worked brakes an example of a modern traction engine may be found attached to one or more heavy cars adapted for street work and on which may be found apparatus for making the mixed materials of which the roadbed is to be constructed and all of which is moved along as the road or street surface is completed when these fine roads become the possession of a country light traction engines for passenger traffic will be found largely supplanting the horse and the steam railroad engines brakes railway and electric have already been referred to in the proper chapters in the latest system of railroading greater attention has been paid to the lives and limbs of those employed as workmen on the trains especially to those of brakemen and if corporations have been slow to adopt such merciful devices legislatures have stepped in to help the matter one great source of accidents in this respect has been due to the necessity of the brakemen entering between the cars while they are in motion to couple them by hand this is now being abolished by automatic couplers by which when the locking means have been withdrawn from connection or thrown up they will be so held until the cars meet again when the locking parts on the respective cars will be automatically thrown and locked as easily and on the same principle as the hand of one man may clasp the hand of another the comfort of passengers and the safety of freight have also been greatly increased by the invention of buffers on railroad cars and trains to prevent sudden and violent concussion fluid pressure car buffers in which a constant supply of fluid under pressure is provided by a pump or train pipe connected to the engine is one of a great variety another notable improvement in this line is the splendid vestibule trains 
in which the cars are connected to one another by enclosed passages and which at their meeting ends are provided with yieldingly supported door-like frames engaging one another by frictional contact usually whereby the shock and rocking of cars are prevented in starting and stopping and their oscillation reduced to a minimum as collisions and accidents cannot always be prevented car frames are now built in which the frames are trussed and made of rolled steel plates angles and channels whereby a car body of great resistance to telescoping or crushing is obtained End of section twenty nine Section 30 of Inventions in the Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Prajakta. Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle. Chapter 29 Ships and Ship Building. Far as the breeze can bear, the billows foam survey our empire and behold our home ships are but boats soliloquized the crafty shylock and were this still true yet this present period has seen wonderful changes in construction the high castellated boats and stones and long prose of the great harry of the 17th century and its successors in the 18th with some moderation of cumbersome matter, gave way to lighter, speedier forms, first appearing in the quick gliding Yankee clippers during the first decade of the 19th century. Eminent naval architects have regarded the proportions of Noah's Ark 300 cubits long, 50 cubits broad, and 30 cubits high, in which the length was six times the breadth and the depth three-fifths of the breadth as the best combination of the elements of strength, capacity, and stability. Even that most modern mercantile vessel known as the whale back with its nearly flat bottom, vertical sides, arched top or deck, scaked or spoon-shaped at bow and stern, straight deck lines, the upper deck cabins and steering gear raised on hollow turrets, with machinery and cargo in the main hull, has not departed much from the safe rule of proportions of its ancient prototype. But in other respects, the ideas of Noah and of the Phoenicians, the best of ancient shipbuilders, as well as the Northmen, the Dutch, the French, and the English, the best shipbuilders of latter centuries, were decidedly improved upon by the Americans who, as above intimated, were revolutionizing the art and building the finest vessels in the early part of the century, and these rivaled in speed the steam vessels for some years after steamships were plowing the rivers and the ocean. Discarding the lofty decks fore and aft and ponderous topsides, the principal characteristics of the American clippers were their fine sharp lines built long and low, broad of beam before the center, sharp above the water, and deep aft. A typical vessel of this sort was the clipper ship Great Republic, built by Donald Mackay of Boston during the first half of the century. She was 325 feet long, 53 feet wide, 37 feet deep, with a capacity of about 4,000 tons. She had four masts, each provided with a lightning rod. A single suit of her sails consisted of 15,563 yards of canvas. Her keel rose for 60 feet forward, gradually curved into the arc of a circle as it blended with the stern. Vessels of her type ran 17 and 18 miles an hour at a time when steam vessels were making only 12 or 14 miles an hour, the latter speed being one 
which it was predicted by naval engineers could not with safety be exceeded with ocean steamships. These vessels directed the attention of shipbuilders to two prominent features, the shape of the bow and the length of the vessel. For the old convex form of bow and stern, the principle of an elongated wedge was substituted, the wedge slightly hollowed on its face, by which the waters were more easily parted and thrown aside. A departure was early made in the matter of strengthening the ribs of oak to better meet the strengths from the rough seas. In 1810, Sir Robert Seppings, surveyor of the English Navy, devised and introduced the system of diagonal bracing. This was an arrangement of timbers crossing the ribs on the inside of the ship at angles of about 45 degrees and braced by diagonals and studs. Of course, the great and leading event of the 19th century in the matter of inventions relating to ships was the introduction of steam as the motive power. Of this, we have treated in the chapter on steam engineering. The giant steam demanded and received the obeisance of every art before devoting his inexhaustible strength to their service. Systems of woodworking and metal manufacture must be revolutionized to give him room to work and to withstand the strokes of his mighty arm. Lord Dundas, at the beginning of the century, had an iron boat built for the Forth and Clyde Canal, which was propelled by steam. But the departure from the adage that ships are but boats did not take place, however, until about 1829-30, when the substitution of iron for wood in the construction of vessels had passed beyond the experimental stage. In those years, the firm of John Leard of Birkenhead began the building of practical iron vessels and he was followed soon by Sir William Fairbairn at Manchester and Randolph Elder and Company and the Fairfield Works on the Clyde. The advantage of iron over wood in strength and in power to withstand tremendous shocks was early illustrated in the Great Britain, built about 1844, the first large successful seagoing vessel constructed. Not long thereafter, this same vessel lay helpless upon the coast of Ireland, driven there by a great storm and beaten by the tremendous waves of the Atlantic with a force that would have in a few hours or days broken up and pulverized a ship of boats and yet the Great Britain lay there several weeks, was finally brought off and again restored to successful service. Wood and iron both have their peculiar advantages and disadvantages. Wood is not only lighter but easily procured and worked and cheaper in many small and private shipyards where an iron frame and parts would be difficult and expensive to produce. It is thought that as to the fouling of ship's bottoms, a wooden hull covered with copper poles less and consequently impedes the speed less that the damage done by shocks or the penetration of shot is not so great or difficult to repair and that the danger of variation of the compass by reason of local attraction of the metal is less. But the advantages of iron and steel far outnumber those of wood. Its strength, its adaptability for all sizes and forms and lines, its increased cheapness, its resistance to short penetration, its durability and now its easy procurement constitute qualities which have established iron shipbuilding as a great new and modern art. In this modern revolution in iron-clad ships, their adaptation to naval warfare was due to the genius of John Erickson and dates practically from the celebrated battle between the iron-clads, the Merrimack and the Monitor in Hampton Roads on the Virginia coast in the Civil War in America in April 1862. Although the tendency at first in building iron and steel vessels, especially for the Navy, 
was towards an entire metal structure later experience resulted in a more composite style using wood in some parts were found best adapted by its capacity of lightness non absorption of heat and less electrical conductivity etc and at the same time protecting such interior portions by an iron shell or framework one great improvement in ship building whether in wood or metal thought of and practiced to some extent in former times but after all a child of this century is the building of the hull and hold in compartments water tight and sometimes fireproof so that in case of a leakage or a fire in one or more compartments the fire or water may be confined there and the extension of the danger to the entire ship prevented in the matter of marine propulsion when the steam engine was made a practical and useful servant by what and men began to think of driving boats and ships with it the problem was how to adapt it to use with propelling means already known paddle wheels and other wheels to move boats in place of oars had been suggested and to some extent used from time to time since the days of the romans and they were among the first devices used in steam vessels their whirl may still be heard on many waters learned men saw no reason why the screw of archimedes should not be used for the same purpose and the idea was occasionally advocated by french and english philosophers from at least 1680 by franklin and watt less than a century later and finally in 1794 Littleton of England obtained a patent for his aquatic propeller consisting of threads formed on a cylinder and revolving in a frame at the head stern or side of a vessel other means had been also suggested prior to 1800 and by the same set of philosophers and experimentally used by practical builders such as steam pumps for receiving the water forward or amid ships and forcing it out a stern thus creating a propulsive movement the latter part of the 18th century teemed with these suggestions and experiments but it remained for the 19th to see their embodiment and adaptation to successful commercial use the earliest most successful demonstrations of screw propellers and paddle wheels in steam vessels in the century where the construction and use of a boat with twin screws by colonel john stevens of hoboken new jersey in 1804 and the paddle wheel steam boat trial of fulton on the hudson in 1807 but it was left to john ericsson that great swedish inventor going to england in 1826 with his brain full of ideas as to steam and solar engines to first perfect the screw propeller he there patented in 1836 his celebrated propeller consisting of several blades or segments of a screw and based on such correct principles of twist that they were at once adopted and applied to steam vessels in 1837 1839 the knowledge of his inventions had preceded him to america where his propeller was at once introduced and used in the vessels francis b ogden and the robert e stockton the latter built by the lairds of birkenhead and launched in 1837 in 1839 or 1840 ericsson went to america and in 1841 he was engaged in the construction of the us ship of war princeton the first naval screw warship built having propelling machinery under the water line and out of reach of shot the idea that steam ships could not be safely run at a greater speed than 10 or 12 miles an hour was now abandoned twice ericsson revolutionized the naval construction of the world by his inventions in america first by the introduction of his screw propeller in the princeton and second by building the iron clad monitor since ericsson's day other inventors have made themselves 
also famous by giving new twist to the tail of this famous fish and new forms to its iron rigged body pneumatic propellers operated by the expulsion of air or gas against the surrounding body of water and chain propellers consisting of a revolving chain provided with paddles or floats have also been invented and tested with more or less successful results a great warship as she lies in some one of the fast modern shipyards of the world resting securely on her long steel backbone from which great ribs of steel rise and curve on either side and far overhead like a monstrous skeleton of some huge animal that the sea alone can produce clothed with a skin also of steel her huge interior lined at bottom with an armored deck that stretches across the entire breadth of the vessel and built upon this deck capacious steel compartments enclosing the engines and boilers the coal the magazines the electric plant for supplying power to various motors for lighting the ship and for furnishing the current to powerful searchlights having compartments for the sick the apothecary shop the surgeon's hospital the mains and the officers quarters above these the conning tower and the armored pilot house then the great guns interspersed among these various parts looking like the sunken eyes or protruding like the bony prominences of some awful sea monster is a structure that gives one an idea of the immense departure which has occurred during the last half century not only from the wooden walls of the navies of all the past but from all its mechanical arts what a great ocean liner contains and what the contributions are to modern ship building from other modern arts it's set forth in the following extract from macleus magazine for september 1900 in describing the deutsch land the deutsch land for instance has a complete refrigerating plant four hospitals a safety deposit vault for the immense quantities of gold and silver which pass between the banks of europe and america eight kitchens a complete post office with german and american clerks 30 electrical motors 36 pumps most of them of american and english make no fewer than 72 steam engines a complete drug store a complete fire department with pumps hose and other fire fighting machinery a library 2600 electric lights two barber shops room for an orchestra and brass band a telegraph system a telephone system a complete printing establishment a photographic dark room a cigar store an electric fire alarm system and a special refrigerator for flowers we have seen in treating the safes and locks how burglars keep pace with the latest inventions to protect property by the use of dynamite and nitroglycerin explosions the reverse of this practice prevails when those policemen of the seas the torpedo boats guard the treasures of the shore it is there the defenders are armed with the irresistible explosives these explosives are either planted in harbors and discharged by electricity from the shore or carried by very swift armored boats or by boats capable of being submerged directed and propelled by mechanisms contained there and controlled from the shore or from other vessel or by boats containing all instrumentalities crew and commander and capable of submerging and raising itself and of attacking and exploding the torpedo when and where desired the latter are now considered as the most formidable and efficient class of destroyers no matter how staunch sound and grand in dimensions man may build his ships old neptune can still toss them but franklin a century and a half ago called attention to his experiments of oiling his locks when in a tempestuous mood and thus rendering the temper of the old man of the sea 
as placid as a summer pond. Ships that had become unmanageable were thus enabled by spreading oil on the waves from the windward side to be brought under control and dangerous surfs subdued so that boats could land. Franklin's idea of pouring oil on the troubled waters has been received during the last quarter of the century and various means for doing it vigorously patent. The means have varied in many instances but chiefly consist of bags and other receptacles to hold and distribute the oil upon the surrounding water with economy and uniformity. At the close of the century, the world was still waiting for the successful airship. A few successful experiments in balloon navigation by the aid of small engines of different forms have been made since 1855. Some believe that Count Zeppelin, an officer of the German army, had solved the great problem, especially since the ascent of his ship made on July 2, 1900 at Lake Constance. It has been asserted that no vessel has yet been made to successfully fly unless made on the balloon principle and Count Zeppelin's boat is on that principle. According to the description of Jürgen Wolf, an aeronaut who took part in the ascent referred to and who published an account of the same in the November number of McClure's 1900, it is not composed of one balloon but of a row of them and these are not exposed when inflated to every breeze that blows but enclosed and combined in an enormous cylindrical shell 420 feet in length about 38 feet in diameter with a volume of 14,780 cubic yards and with ends pointed like a cigar. This shell is a framework made up of aluminium trellis work and divided into 17 compartments, each having its own gas bag. The frame is further strengthened and the balloons stayed by a network of aluminium wire and the entire frame covered with a soft remy fiber. Over this is placed a watertight covering of pegamoid and the lower part covered with light silk. An air space of 2 feet is left between the cover and the balloons. Beneath the balloons extends a walking breech 226 feet long and from this breech it's suspended two aluminium cars at front and rear of the center adapted to hold all the operative machinery and the operator and other passengers. The balloons provided with proper valves serve to lift the structure, large four-wind screws, one on each side of the ship their shafts mounted on a light framework extending from the body of the ship and driven backward and forward by two light benzene engines, one on each car, constituted the propelling force. Dirigibility steering was provided for by an apparatus consisting of a double pair of rudders, one pair forward and one aft, reaching out like great fins and controlled by light metal cords from the cars. A ballast of water was carried in a compartment under each car. To give the ship an upward or a downward movement, the plane on which the ship rests was provided with a weight adapted to slip back and forth on a cable underneath the balloon shell. When the weight was far aft, the tip of the ship was upward and the movement was upward. When at the forward end of the movement was downward and when at the center the ship was poised and traveled in a horizontal plane. The trip was made over the lake on a quiet evening. A distance of 3 and 3 quarter miles at a height of 1300 feet was made in 17 minutes. Evolutions from a straight course were accomplished. The ship was lowered to the lake on which it settled easily and rolled smoothly. The other great plan of air navigation receiving the attention of scientists and aeronauts is the aeroplane system. Although the cohesive force of the air is so exceedingly small that it cannot be relied upon as a sufficient resisting medium through which propulsion may be accomplished alone by a counter resisting agent like propeller blades, Yet it is known what weight the air has 
and it has been ascertained what expanse of a thin plane is necessary without other means to support the weight of a man in the air. To this idea must be added the means of flight, of starting and maintaining a stable flight and of directing its course. Careful observation of the manner of the flight of large heavy birds, especially in starting, has led to some successful experiments. They do not rise at once, but require an initiative force for soaring, which they obtain by running on the ground before spreading their wings. The action of the wings in folding and unfolding for maintaining the flight and controlling its direction is then to be noted. It is along these lines that inventions in this system are now working. An initiative mechanism to start the ship along the earth or water, to raise it at an angle, to spread planes of sufficient extent to support the weight of the machine, and its operators on the body of the air column, flight engines to give the wing planes an opening and closing action, radars to steer by, means for maintaining equilibrium, and means when landing to float upon the water or roll upon the land, these are the principal problems that navigators of the great seas above us are now at work upon. End of section 30. Section 31 of Inventions in the Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Prajakta. Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle. Chapter 30 Illuminating Gas. How wonderful that sunbeams absorbed by vegetation in the primordial edges of the earth and buried in its depths as vegetable fossils through immeasurable eras of time until system upon system of slowly formed rocks have been piled above should come forth at last at the disenchanting touch of science and turn the light of civilized man into day. Professor E. L. Yeomans the invention of artificial light has extended the available term of human life by giving the night to man's use. It has, by the social intercourse it encourages, polished his manners and refined his tastes, and perhaps as much as anything else, has aided his intellectual progress. Draper, if one desires to know what the condition of cities, towns and peoples was before the 19th century had lightened and enlightened them, let him step into some poor country town in some out of the way region and such may yet be found at night, pick his way along rough pavements and no pavements by the light of a smoky lamp placed here and there at corners and of weeping lamps and limp candles in the windows of shops and houses and meet people armed with tin lanterns throwing a dubious light across the pathways. Let him be prepared to be assailed by the odors of the undrained gutters, ditches and roads called streets and escape if he can, stumbling and falling into them. Let him take care also that he avoid in the darkness the drippings from the overhanging eaves or windows and falling upon the slippery steps of the dim doorway he may be about to enter. Within, let him overlook, if he can, in the hospitable reception, the dim and smoky atmosphere, and observe that the brightest and best as well as the most cheerful illuminant flashes from the wide open fireplace. Occasionally, a glowing grate might be met. The 18th century did have its glowing grates and its still more glowing furnaces of coal in which the ore was melted and by the light of which the castings were made. It is very strange that year after year for successive generations, men saw the hard black coal break under the influence of heat and burst into flames which lit up every corner without learning beyond sundry accidents and experiments that this ghast or geest or spirit or vapor or gas as it was variously called 
could be led away from its source, ignited at a distance and made to give light and heat at other places than just where it was generated. Thus, Dr. Clayton, Dean of Kildare, Ireland in 1688, distilled gas from coal and lit and burned it and told his learned friend, the Honorable Robert Boyle, about it, who announced it with interest to the Royal Society and again it finds mention in the Philosophical Transactions 50 years later. Then, in 1726, Dr. Hales told how many cubic inches of gas a certain number of grains of coal would produce. Then Bishop Watson in 1750 passed some gas through water and carried it in pipes from one place to another and then Lord Dundonald in 1786 built some ovens, distilled coal and tar, burned the gas and got a patent. In the same year, Dr. Riekel of Woodsburg lighted his laboratory with gas made by the dry distillation of bones, but all these were experiments. Finally, William Murdoch, the owner of large workshops at Redruth in Cornwall, a practical man and mechanic and a keen observer using soft coal to a large extent in his shops, tried with success in 1792 to collect the escaping gas and with it lit up the shops. Whether he continued steadily to so use the gas or only at intervals, at any rate it seems to have been experimental and failed to attract attention. It appears that he repeated the experiment at the celebrated steam engine works of Bolton and Watt at Soho near Birmingham in 1798 and again illuminated the works in 1802 on occasion of a peace jubilee. In the meantime, in 1801, Le Bon, a Frenchman at Paris, had succeeded in making illuminating gas from wood, lit his house therewith and proposed to light the whole city of Paris. Thus, it may be said that illuminating gas and the new century were born together, the former preceding the latter a little and lighting the way. Then in 1803, the English periodicals began to take the matter up and discuss the whole subject. One magazine objected to its use in houses on the ground that the curtains and furniture would be ruined by the saturation produced by the oxygen and hydrogen and that the curtains would have to be wrung out the next morning after the illumination. There doubtless was good cause for objection to the smoky, unpleasant smelling light then produced. In America, in 1806, David Melville of Newport, Rhode Island, lighted with gas his own house and the street in front of it. In 1813, he took out a patent and lighted several factories. In 1817, his process was applied to Beaver Tail Lighthouse on the Atlantic coast, the first use of illuminating gas in lighthouses. Coal oil and electricity have since been found better illuminants for this purpose. Murdoch, Windsor, Clegg and others continue to illuminate the public works and buildings of England. Westminster Bridge and the Houses of Parliament were lighted in 1813 and the streets of London in 1815. Paris was lighted in 1820 and the largest American cities from 1816 to 1825. But it required the work of the chemists as well as the mechanics to produce the best gas. The rod of science had touched the rock again and from the earth had sprung another servant with power to serve mankind and waited the skilled brain and hand to direct its course. Produced almost entirely from bituminous coal, it was found to be composed chiefly of carbon, oxygen and hydrogen but various other gases were mixed therewith. To determine the proper proportions of these gases, to know which should be increased or wholly or partly eliminated, required the careful labors of patient chemists. They taught also how the gas should be distilled, condensed, cleaned, scrubbed, confined in retorts and its flow measured and controlled. Fortunately, the latter part of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th 
had produced chemists whose investigations and discoveries paved the way for success in this revolution in the world of light. Priestley had discovered oxygen. Dalton had divided matter into atoms and shown that in its every form, whether solid, liquid or gaseous, these atoms had their own independent, characteristic, unalterable weight and that gases diffused themselves in certain proportions. Bartholet, Graham and a host of others in England, France and Germany advanced the art. The highest skilled mechanics like Clegg of England supplied the apparatus. He, it was who invented a gas purifier, liquid gas meter and other useful contrivances. As the character of the gas as an illuminator depends on the quantity of hydrocarbon or olefiant elements it contains, great efforts were made to invent processes and means of carburating it. The manufacture of gas was revolutionized by the invention of water gas. The main principle of this process is the mixture of hydrogen with the vapor of some hydrocarbon. Hydrogen burns with very little light and the purpose of the hydrocarbon is to increase the brilliancy of the flame. The hydrogen gas is so obtained by the decomposition of water effected by passing steam through highly heated coals. Patents began to be taken out in this line in England in 1823-24 by Donovan in 1830, George Lowe in 1832 and White in 1847. But in England, water gas could not compete with coal gas in cheapness. On the contrary, in America, especially after the petroleum wells were opened up, and nature supplied the hydrocarbon in roaring wells and fountains, water gas came to the front. The leading invention there in this line was that of T. S. C. Loe of Morristown, Pennsylvania in 1873. In Loe's process, anthracite coal might be used, which was raised in a suitable retort to a great heat, then superheated steam admitted over this hot bed and decomposed into hydrogen and carbonic oxide, then a small stream of naphtha or crude petroleum was thrown upon the surface of the burning coal and from these decompositions and mixtures, a rich olefiant product and other light-giving gases were produced. The Franklin Institute of Philadelphia in 1886 awarded Lowe or his representatives a grand medal of honor his being the invention exhibited that year which in their opinion contributed most of the welfare of mankind. A number of inventors have followed in the direction said by Loewe, the largest part of gas manufacture which has become so extensive embodies the basic idea of Loewe process. The competition set up by the electricians, especially in the production of the beautiful incandescent light for indoor illumination has spurred inventors of gas processes to renewed efforts, much to the benefit of that great multitude who sit in darkness until corporations furnish them with light. It was found by Siemens, the great German inventor of modern gas regenerative furnace systems, that the quality of the gas was much improved and a greater intensity of light obtained by heating the gases and air before combustion, a plan particularly adopted in lighting large spaces. To describe in detail the large number of inventions relating to the manufacture of gas would require a huge volume. The generators, carburetors, retorts, mixers, purifiers, meters, scrubbers, holders, condensers, governors, indicators, registers, chargers, pressure regulators, etc., etc. It was a great convenience outside of towns and cities where gas mains could not be laid to have domestic plants and portable gas apparatus work on the same principles but in miniature form adopted to a single house but the exercise of great ingenuity was required to render such adaptation successful. In the use of liquid illuminants, 
which need a wick to feed them the argand burner that arrangement of concentric tubes between which the wick is confined although invented by argand in 1784 yet has occupied a vast field of usefulness in connection with the lamps of the 19th century a dangerous but very extensively used illuminating liquid before coal oil was discovered was camphene distilled from turpentine it gave a good light but was not a safe domestic companion great attention has recently been paid to the production of acetylene gas produced by the reaction between calcium carbide and water the making of the calcium carbide by the decomposition of mixed pulverized lime and coal by the use of a powerful electric battery is a preliminary step in the production of this gas and was a subsequent discovery the electric light acetylene magnesium and other modern sources of light although they may be more brilliant and intense than coal gas cannot compete in cheapness of production with the latter thus far illuminating coal gas is still the queen of artificial lights after gas was fairly started in lighting streets and buildings in adaptation to lamps followed and among the most noted of gas lamps is that of von welsbach who combined a bunsen gas flame and a gas chimney with a mantle located therein this mantle is a gauze like structure made of refractory quartz or of certain oxide which when heated by the gas flame produce an incandescent glow of intense brilliancy with a reduced consumption of gas end of section 31section 32 of inventions in the century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org inventions in the century by william henry doolittle brick pottery glass plastics when the 19th century dawned Men were making brick in the same way for the most part that they were fifty centuries before. It is recorded in the eleventh chapter of Genesis that when the whole earth was of one language and one speech, it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Then commenced the building of Babel, who taught the trade to the brickmakers of Shinar. The journey from the east continued, and with it went brickmaking to Greece and Rome, across the continent of Europe, across the English Channel, until the brickwork of Caesar, stamped by the trademark of his legions, was found on the banks of the Thames, and through the fields of Celeron and York, Alfred the Great encouraged the trade, and the manufacture flourished finally under Henry the Eighth, Elizabeth, and Charles the First. As to pottery, could we only know who among the peoples of the earth first discovered, used, or invented fire? We might know who were the first makers of baked earthenware. Doubtless the art of pottery arose before men learned to bake the plastic clay. In that groping time, when men kneading the soft clay with their fingers, or imprinting their footsteps in the yielding surface and learning that the sun's heat stiffened and dried those forms into durability, applied the discovery to the making of crude vessels, as children unto this day make dishes from the tenacious mud. But the artificial burning of the vessels was no doubt a later imitation of nature. Alongside the rudest, and earliest chipstone implements have been found the hollow clay dish for holding fire or food or water as the fragment of a speech or song a waking or a sleeping vision the dream of a vanished hand a draught of water from a familiar spring the almost perished fragrance of a pressed flower called back the singer the loved and lost the loved and won the home of childhood 
or the parting hour. So in the manner there linger in the crowning decade of the crowning century, bits of ancient ingenuity which recall to the whole people the fragrance and beauty of its past. Professor O. T. Mason, the same gifted writer, adds, who has not read, with almost breaking heart, the story of fallacy, the Huguenot Potter? But what have our witnesses to say of that long line of humble creatures that conjured out of prophetic clay, without wheels or furnace, forms and decorations of imperishable beauty, which are now being copied in glorified material in the best factories of the world? In ceramic as well as textile art, the first inventors were women. They quarried the clay, manipulated it, constructed and decorated the ware, burned it in a rude furnace, and wore it out in a hundred uses. From the early dawn of human history to its present noonday civilization, the progress of man may be traced in his pottery. Before printing was an art, he inscribed on it his literature. Poets and painters have adorned it, and in its manufacture have been embodied through all ages the choicest discoveries of the chemist, the inventor, and the mechanic. It would be pleasant to trace the history of pottery from at least the time of Homer, who draws a metaphor from the potter, seated before his wheel and twirling it with both hands, as he shapes the plastic clay upon it, to dwell upon the clay tablets and many-colored vases, covered with Egyptian scenes and history, to re-excite wonder over the arts of China, in a porcelain, the production of its delicacy and bright colors, wrapped in such mystery, and stagnant for so many ages, but revived and rejuvenated in Japan, to recall to mind the styles and composition of the Phoenician vases, with mythological legends burned immortally therein. The splendid work of the Greek potters, to lift the Samian and wreathed bowl, filled with Samian wine. To look upon the Roman pottery, statues and statuettes of Rome's earlier and better days, the celebrated faience, enameled pottery, at its home in Vienza, Italy, and from the hands of its master, Luca della Bovia, to trace the history of the rare Italian Majolica, to tread with light steps the bright tiles of the Saracens, to rehearse the story of Bernard Polissi, the father of the beautiful French enameled ware, to bring to view the splendid old ware of Nuremberg, the raised white figures on the deep blue plaques of Florence, the honest Delft ware of Holland, and finally to relate the revolution in the production of pottery throughout all Europe, caused by the discoveries and inventions of Wedgwood of England in the 18th century. All this would be interesting, but we must hasten on to the equally splendid and more practical works of the busy 19th century, in which many toilsome methods of the past have been superseded by labor-saving contrivances. The application of machinery to the manufacture of brick began to receive attention during the latter part of the 18th century, after Watt had harnessed steam, and a few patents were issued in England and America, at that time for such machinery of that character, but little was practically done. The operations in brick-making, to the accomplishment of which by machines the inventors of the nineteenth century had devoted great talent, relate, first, to the preparation of the clay. In ancient Egypt, in places where water abounded, it appears that the clay was lifted from the bottoms of ponds and lakes on the end of poles was formed into bricks, then sun-dried, modernly called adobes. The clay for making these required a stiffening material, but this straw was used, mixed with the clay, and stubble was also used in the different courses, hence the old metaphor of worthlessness of bricks without straw, but of course in burning, and in modern processes of pressing unburnt bricks. Straw is no longer used, Sand should abound in the clay in a certain proportion, or be mixed therewith, otherwise the clay, whether burnt or unburned, will crumble. Stones, gravel, and sticks must be removed, otherwise the contraction of the clay and expansion of the stones on burning produce a weak and crumbling structure. 
brick clay generally is colored by the oxide of iron, and in proportion as this abounds, the burnt bricks is of a lighter or a deeper red. It may be desired to add coloring matter or mix different forms of clay, or add sand or other ingredients. Clay treated by hand was for ages kneaded as dough is kneaded, by the hand or feet, and the clay was often long subjected, sometimes for years, to exposure to the sun, frost and sun to disintegrate and ripen it. As the clay must be first disintegrated, ground or pulverized, as grain is first ground to flour to make and mold the bread, so the use of a grinding mill was long ago suggested. The first machine to do all this work goes by the humble name Pug Mill. Many ages ago, the Chileans of South America hung two ponderous solid wood or stone wheels on an axis turned by a vertical shaft and operated by animal power. The wheels were made to run round on a deep basin in which oars or stones or grain were placed to be crushed. The Chilean mill, in principle, was adopted a century or so ago in Europe to the grinding of clay. The pug mill has assumed many different forms in this age, and separate preliminary mills, consisting of rollers of different forms for grinding, alone are often used before the mixing operation. In one modern form, the pug mill consists of an inverted, conical-shaped cylinder provided with a set of interior revolving blades arranged horizontally, and below this a spiral arrangement of blades on a vertical axis, by which the clay is thoroughly cut up and crushed against the surrounding walls of the mill, in the meantime, softened with water or steam if desired, and mixed with sand if necessary, and when thus ground and tempered, is finally pressed down through the low opening of the cylinder and directly into suitable brick molds beneath. Second, the next operation is for molding and pressing the brick, to take the place of that ancient and still used mold for filling a mold of a certain size by the hands with a lump of soft clay, scraping off the surplus, and then dumping the mold upon a drying floor. A great variety of machines have been invented. In some, the pug mill is arranged horizontally to feed out the clay in the form of a long horizontal slab, which is cut up into proper lengths to form the bricks. Some machines are in the form of a large horizontal revolving wheel, having the moles arranged in its top base. Each mole charged with clay as the wheel presents it under the discharging spout of the grinding mill and then the clay is pressed by pistons of plungers worked by a rocking beam, and adapted to descend and fit into the mold at stated intervals, or the moles, carried in a circular direction, may have movable bottom plates, which may be pressed upwards successively by pistons attached to them and raised by inclines on which they travel, forcing the clay against a large circular top plate, and in the last part of the movement, carrying the pressed brick through an aperture to the top of the plate, where it is met by and carried away on an endless apron. In some machines, two great wheels mesh together, one carrying the moles in its face, and the other the presser plate plungers. Working in the former, the bricks being finally forced out onto a moving belt by the action of cam followers, or by other means. In others, the moles are passed, each beneath the gravity descending or cam force plunger, the clay being thus stamped by impact into a form, or in other forms the clay in the moles may be subjected to successive pressure from the cam-operated pistons arranged horizontally and on a line with the discharging belt. Third, the drying and burning of the brick. The old methods were painfully slow and tedious. A long time was occupied in seasoning the clay, and then after the bricks were molded, another long time was necessary to dry them, and a final lengthy period was employed to burn them in crude kilns. These old methods were too slow for modern wants, but they still are in vogue alongside of modern inventions, as in all ages the use of old arts and implements have continued along by the side of later inventions and discoveries. No useful contrivances 
are suddenly or apparently ever entirely supplanted. The implements of the Stone Age are still found in use by some, whose environment has deprived them of the knowledge of, or desire to use better tools. The single ox pulling the crooked stick plow, or other similar ancient earth stirrer, and Ruth with her sickle and sheaves, may be found not far from the steam plow and the automatic binder. But the use of antiquated machinery is not followed by those who lead the procession in this industrial age. Consequently, other means than the slow processes of nature to dry brick and other ceramics and the crude kilns are giving way to modern heat-distributing structures. Air and heat are driven by fans through chambers in which the brick are openly piled on cars, the surplus heat and steam from an engine room being often used for this purpose, and the cars so laden are slowly pushed on the tracks through heated chambers. Passages and pipes and chimneys for heat and air controlled by valves are provided, and the waste moisture drawn off through bottom drains or up chimneys, the draft of which is increased by a hot blast, or blasts of heated air, are driven in one direction through a chamber, while the brick are moved through in the opposite direction, or a series of drying chambers are separated from each other by iron folding doors, the temperature increasing as cars are moved on tracks from one chamber to another. Dr. Hoffman of Berlin invented different forms of drying and burning chambers, which attracted great attention. In his kiln, the bricks are stacked in an annular chamber, and the fire made to progress from one section of the chamber to another, burning the brick as the heat advances, and as fast as one section of green brick is dried or burned, it is withdrawn, and a green section presented. Austria introduced most successful and thorough systems of drying brick about 1870. In some great kilns, fires are never allowed to cease. One kiln has been kept thus heated for fifteen years. Thus great quantities of green brick can at any time be pushed into the kiln on tracks, and when burned, pushed out, and thus the process may go on continuously, day and night. To return to pottery, as before stated, Wedgwood of England revolutionized the art of pottery in the 18th century. He was aided by Floxham. Before their time, all earthenware pottery was what is now called soft pottery. That is, it was unglazed, simply baked clay, lustrous or semi-glazed and enameled, having a harder surface. Wedgwood invented the hard porcelain surface and very many beautiful designs. To improve such earthenware and to best decorate it are the objects around which modern inventions have mostly clustered. The regenerative principle of heating above referred to, employed in some kilns, and so successfully incorporated in the regenerator's inventions since 1850 by Siemens, Frank, Boutrous, Bichiru, Poussard, and others, consisting in using the intensely hot wasted gases from laboratories or combustion chambers to heat the incoming air, and carrying the mingled products of combustion into chambers and passages to heat, dry, or burn materials placed therein, has been of great service in the production of modern pottery, not only in great saving in the amount of fuel, but in reduction and loss of pieces of ware spoiled in the firing. The old method of burning wood was of coal, or charcoal at the bottom of a small old-fashioned cylindrical fire brick kiln, attended to by hand, and heating the articles of pottery arranged on shelves in the chamber above, is done away with to a great extent in large manufactories, or the making of stone and earthenware, although still followed in many porcelain kilns. Inventions in the line of pottery kilns have received the aid of woman, Susan Frackleton of the United States invented a portable kin for firing pottery and porcelain, for which he obtained a patent in 1886. As in drying clay for brick, so in drying clay for porcelain and pottery generally, great improvements have been made in the drying of the clay, and other materials to be mixed therewith. A great step was taken to aid drying by the invention of the filter press, 
in which the materials, after they are mixed and while still wet, are subjected to such pressure that all surplus water is removed and all air squeezed out, by which the enclosure of air bubbles in the clay is prevented. Despairing of excelling the china porcelain, although French investigators having alleged their discovery of such methods, modern inventors have contented themselves in inventing new methods and compositions. Charles Asinal, the potter of tours, born in 1796, rediscovered and revived the art of palissy. About 1842, Thomas Badham of England invented the method of imitating marble and other statuary by a composition of silica, alumina, soda, and traces of lime, magnesia, and iron, reducing it to liquid form and pouring it into plaster molds forming the figure or group. His plaster cast soon became famous. In the use of materials, the aid of chemists was had. In finding the proper ingredients to fuse with sand to produce the best forms of common and fine by ants. Porcelain molding and its accompanying ornamentation and the use of apparatus for molding by compression and by exhaustion of the air has become since that time a great industry. Porcelain colors. Chemists also aided and discovered what metallic ingredients could best be used when mixed with the clay and sand to produce the desired colors. As soon as a new metal was discovered, it was tested to find, among other things, what vitrifiable color it would produce. In the production of metallic clays, as the oxides generally are employed, the colors are usually applied to where when it is in its unglazed or biscuit form. In the biscuit or bisque form, pottery is bibulous. The prepared glaze sinks into its pores and, when burned, forms a vitreous coating. The application of oil colors and designs to wear before baking by the bat system of printing originated in the 18th and was perfected in the 19th century. It consists of impressing oil pictures on a bat of blue, and then pressing the bat onto the porous unbaked clay or porcelain which transferred the colors. This was another revolution in the art. One man of ages of applying colors to wear is first to reduce the mixture to a liquid form called slip, and then, if the Chinese method is followed, to dip the color up on the end of a hollow bamboo rod, which end is covered with wire gauze. Then, by blowing through the rod, the color was sprayed or deposited on the wear. Another method is the use of a brush and comb, the brush being dipped into the colored matter. The comb is passed over the brush in such manner as to cause the paint to spatter the object with fine drops or particles. A very recent method, by which the beautiful background of blended colors of the celebrated workwood pottery of Cincinnati, Ohio, have become distinguished consists in laying the color upon the wear in a cloud or sheet of almost imperceptibleness by the use of an air atomizer blown by the operator. By the use of this simple instrument, the laying on of a single color, or the delicate blending and shadings of two or more colors, in very beautiful effects, is easily produced. This use of the atomizer commenced in 1884, and was claimed as the invention of a lady, Miss Laura Fry, who obtained a patent for thus blowing the atomized spray coloring batter on pottery in 1889. But it was held by the courts that she was anticipated by experiments of others, and by descriptions in previous patents of the spraying of paint on other objects by compressed air apparatus known as the air brush. However, this introduction of the use of the atomizer caused quite a revolution in the art of applying colors to pottery in the forming of backgrounds. Enamel ware is no longer confined to pottery. About 1878, Niedrig House in the United States began to enamel sheet iron by the application of glaze and iron oxide, giving such articles a granite appearance, and since then, metallic cooking vessels bathtubs, etc., having converted an appearance into the finest earthenware and porcelain, and far more durable, beautiful, and useful 
than the plain metal alone for such purposes. When we remember that for many centuries wood and pewter, and to some extent crude earthenware, were the materials from which the dishes of the great bulk of the human family were made, as well as their table and mantel ornaments, and compare them in character and plenteousness with the table and other ware of even the poorest character of today, we can appreciate how much has been done in this direction to help the human family by modern inventions. Artificial Stone The world as yet has not, so far, exhausted its supply of stone and marble as to compel a resort to artificial productions on a great scale, and yet to meet the demands of those localities wherein the natural supplies of gold building stones and marble are very scarce, necessitating when used a long and expensive transportation, methods have been adopted by which, at comparatively small cost, fine imitations of the best stones and marbles have been produced, having all the durability and artistic qualities of the originals, as for the most part, they are composed of the same materials as the stone and marbles themselves. The characteristic backgrounds, the veins and shadowings, and the soft colors of various marbles have been quite successfully imitated by treating dehydrated gypsum with various coloring solutions. Sandstones have been molded or pressed from the same ingredients, and with either smooth or undressed faces. When necessary, the mixture is colored to resemble precisely the original stones. One of the improvements in the manufacture and use of modern cements and artificial stones consists in their application to the making of streets and sidewalks. Neat, smooth, hard, beautiful pavements are now taking the place everywhere of the unsatisfactory gravel, wood, and brick pavements of former days. We know that the Romans and other ancient people had their hydraulic cements, and the plaster on some of their walls stands today to attest its good quality. Modern inventors have turned their attention in recent years to the production of machines to grind, crush, mix, and set the materials, and to apply them to large wall surfaces in place of hand labor. Ready-made plaster of a fine quality is now manufactured in great quantities. It needs only the addition of a little water to reduce it to a condition for use, and a machine operated by compressed air may be had they're spreading it quickly over the lath work of wood or sheet metal, slats, or over rough cement ceilings and walls. Glass. The sister of pottery is glass. It may have been an accidental discovery, occurring when men made fire upon a sandy knoll or beach, that fire could melt and fuse sand and ashes, or sand and lime, or sand and soda or some other alkali and with which may also have been mixed some particles of iron, or lead, or manganese, or alumina, to produce that hard, lustrous, vitreous, brittle article that we call glass. But who invented the method of following the viscous mass into form on the end of a hollow tube? Who invented the scissors and shears for cutting and trimming it when soft? Or the use of the diamond, or its dust, for polishing it when hard. History is silent on these points. The tablets of the most ancient days of Egypt yet be recovered, shall glass blowers at work at their trade, and the names of the first and original inventors are buried in oblivion. Each age has handed down to us from many countries specimens of glassware, which will compare favorably in beauty and finish with any that can be made today. Yet with the knowledge of making glass of the finest description existing for centuries, it is strange that its manufacture was not extended to supply the wants of mankind, to which its use now seems so indispensable. And yet as late as the 16th and 17th centuries, glass windows were found only in the houses of the wealthy, in the churches and palaces, and glass mirrors were unknown, except to the rich, as curiosities and as aids to the scientists in the early days of telescopy. Poor people used oil paper, eyes and glass, thinly shaved leather, resembling parchment, and thin sheets of soft, pale, crystallized stone known as talc and soapstone. 
The 19th century has been characterized as the scientific century of glass, and the term commercial may well be added to that designation. Its commercial importance and the advancement in its manufacture during the first half of the century is illustrated in the fact that the Crystal Palace of the London Industrial Exhibition of 1851, although containing nearly 900,000 square feet of glass, was furnished by a single firm, Messrs. Chance and Company of London, without materially delaying their other orders. In addition to scientific discoveries, the manufacture of glass in England received a great impetus by the removal of onerous excise duties, which had been imposed on its manufacture. The principal improvements in the art of glass making affected during the 19th century may be summarized as follows. First, materials. By the investigations of chemists and practical trials, it was learned what particular effect was produced by the old ingredients employed, and it was found that the colors and qualities of glass, such as clearness, strength, tenacity, purity, etc., could be greatly modified and improved by the addition to the sand of certain new ingredients. By analysis, it was learned what different metallic oxides should be employed to produce different colors. This knowledge before was either preserved in secrecy, or accidentally or empirically practiced or unknown. Thus it was learned and established that lime hardens the glass and adds to its luster, that the use of ordinary ingredients, the silicates of lime, magnesia, iron, soda, and potash, in their impure form, will produce the coarser kinds of glass, such as that of which green bottles are made. The silicates of soda and lime give the common window glass and French plate that the beautiful varieties of bohemian glass are chiefly a silicate of potash and lime. The crystal of flint glass, so-called because formerly pulverized flints were used in making it, can be made of a suitable combination of potassium, plumbic, silicate, that the plumbic oxide greatly increases its transparency, brilliancy, and refractive power. That paste, that form of glass from which imitations of diamonds are cut, may be produced by adding a large proportion of the oxide of lead, and by the addition of a trace of ferric oxide or uranic acid, the yellow topaz can be had, that by substituting cobaltic oxide, the brilliant blue sapphire is produced that cuperic oxide will give the emerald, gold oxide the ruby, magnetic oxide the royal purple, and a mixture of cobaltic and magnetic oxides, the rich black onyx. Professor Faraday, as early as 1824, had noticed a change in color gradually produced in glass containing oxide of manganese by exposure to the rays of the sun. This observation induced an American gentleman Mr. Thomas Gaffield, a merchant of Boston, to further experiments in this direction. His experiments commenced in 1863, and he subjected 80 different kinds of glass, colored and uncolored, and manufactured in many different countries, to this exposure of the sun's rays. He found that not only glass having manganese as an element, but nearly every species of glass was so affected some in shorter and some in longer times, that this discoloration was not due to the heat rays of the sun, but to its actinic rays, and that the original color of the glass could be reproduced by reheating the same. Mr. Gaffield also extended his experiments to ascertain the power of different colored glasses to transmit the actinic or chemical rays, and found that blue would transmit the most and red and orange the least. Others proceeded on lines of investigation in ascertaining the best materials to be employed in glass making, in producing the clearest and most permanent uncolored light, the best colored lights for desired purposes. Glass is having the best effects on the growth of plants, and the best class for refracting, dispersing, and transmitting both natural lights and those great modern artificial lights, gas, and electricity. Another illustration of modern scientific investigation and success in glassmaking materials is seen at the celebrated German glassworks at Jena 
under the management of Professors Ernst Abbey and Dr. Schott, commenced in 1881. They, too, found that many substances had each its own peculiar effect in the refraction and dispersion of light, and introduced no fewer than 28 new substances in glass-making. Their special work was the production of glass for the finest scientific and optical purposes, and the highest grades of commercial glass. They have originated over 100 new kinds of glass, their lenses for telescopes and microscopes and photographic cameras, and glass and prisms, and for all chemical and other scientific work, have a worldwide reputation so that, in materials of composition the old days, in which there were substantially but two varieties of glass, the old-fashioned standard crown and flint glass have passed away. Methods The revolution in the production of glass has been greatly aided by, also, new methods of treatment of the old as well as the new materials. For instance, the application of the Siemens regenerative furnace, already alluded to in referring to pottery, in place of old-fashioned kilns, and by which the amount of smoke is greatly diminished, fuel saved, and the color of the glass improved. Pots are used containing the materials to be melted and not heated in the presence of the burning fuel, but by the heated gases in separate compartments. Another process is that of Monsieur de Bastille added to by others of toughening glass by plunging it while hot and pasty, and after it has been shaped, annealed and reheated into a bath of grease, whereby the rapid cooling and the grease it changes its molecular condition so that it is less dense, resists breaking to a greater degree, and presents no sharp edges when broken. Another process is that of making plate glass by the cylinder process, rolling it into large sheets. Other processes are those for producing hollow wear by pressing in molds, for decorating for surface enameling of sheet glass, whereby beautiful lace patterns are transferred from the woven or netted fabric itself by using it as a stencil to distribute upon the surface of pulverized enamel, which is afterwards burned on, of producing iridescent glass in which is exhibited the lights and shadows of delicate soap bubble colors by the throwing against the surface of hydrochloric acid and to pressure, or the fumes of other materials volatilized in a reheating furnace. Then there is Toad's process for platinizing glass, by which a reflecting mirror is produced without silvering or otherwise coating its back, by first applying a thin coating of platinic chloride, mixed with an oil to the surface of the glass and heating the same, by which the mirror reflects from its front face. The platinum film is so thin that the pencil and hand of a draftsman may be seen through it, the object to be carried being seen by reflection. Again there is the process of making glass wool or silk, which is glass drawn out into such extremely fine threads that it may be used for all purposes of silk threads in the making of fabrics, for decorative purposes, and in some more useful purposes, such as the filtration of water and other liquids. We have already had occasion to refer to Tillman's sandblast in describing pneumatic apparatus. In glass manufacture, the process is used in etching on glass, designs of every kind, both simple and intricate. The sand forced by steam or by compressed air on the exposed portions of the glass on which the design rests will cut the same deeply or most deliberately as the hand and eye of the operator may direct. Machines, in addition to the new styles of furnaces, molds and melting, and rolling mills to which we have alluded, mention may be made of annealing and cooling ovens by which latter the glass is greatly improved by being allowed to gradually cool. A large number of instruments have been invented for special purposes, such as for making the beautiful expensive cut glass, which is flint glass, ground by wheels of iron, stone, and emery into the desired designs, while water is being applied, and then polished by wheels of wooden pumice, or rotten stone, for grinding and polishing glass for lenses, and for polishing and finishing plate glass, for applying glass lining to metal pipes, tubes, etc., 
with a delicate engraving of glass by small revolving copper discs, varying in size from the diameter of a cent down to one-fifteenth of an inch, cutting the finest blade of grass, a tiny bud, the downy wing of an insect, or the faint shadow of an exquisite eyebrow. Cameo cutting and incrustation, porcelain electroplating and molding apparatus, an apparatus for making porcelain plates before drying and burning may be added to the list. It would be a much longer list to enumerate the various objects made of glass, unknown or not in common use in former generations. The reader must call to mind or imagine any article which he thinks desirable to be made from or covered with this lustrous, indestructible material, or any practical form or instrument for the transmission of light, and it is quite likely you will find it already at hand, in shops or instruments and factories, ready for its making. Rubber Goodyear The rubber tree, whether in India with its immense trunk, towering above all its fellows and wearing a lofty crown, hundreds of feet in circumference, a mixed green and yellow blossoms, or in South America, more slender and shorter but still beautiful in clustered leaves and flowers on its long, loosely pendant branches, or in Africa, still more slender and growing as a giant creeper upon the highest trees along the water courses, hiding its struggling support and festooning the whole forest with its glossy dark green leaves, sweetly scented, pure white, star-like flowers, and its orange-like fruit yields from its veins a milk which a man has converted into one of the most useful articles of the century. The modes of treating this milky juice varies among the natives of the several countries where the trees abound. In Africa they cut or strip the bark, and as the milk oozes out, the natives catch and smear it thickly over their limbs and bodies, and when it dries, pull it off and cut it into blocks for transportation. In Brazil, the juice is collected in clay vessels and smoked and dried in a smoldering fire of palm nuts, which give the material its dark brown appearance. They mold the softened rubber over clay patterns in the form of shoes, jars, vases, tubes, etc., and as they are sticky, they carry them separated on poles to the large towns and seaports and sell them in this condition. It was some such article that first attracted the attention of Europeans, who during the 18th century called the attention of their countrymen to them. It was in 1736 that La Comandine described rubber to the French Academy. He afterward resided in the valley of the Amazon ten years. And then he and his years Heserich, Mecker, and Grossat, again by their writings and experiments, interested the scientific and commercial world in the matter. In 1770, Dr. Priestley published the fact that this rubber had become notable for rubbing out pencil marks, bits of it being sold for a high price for that purpose. About 1797, some Englishmen began to make waterproof varnish from it and to take out patents of the same. This was as far as the art had advanced in chowcook, or rubber, in the 18th century. In 1819, Mr. Mackintosh of Glasgow began experimenting with the oil of naphtha obtained from gas works as a solvent for Indian rubber, and so successfully that he made a waterproof varnish which applied to fabrics, took out his patent in England in 1823, and thus was started the celebrated Macintoshes. In 1825, Thomas C. Wales, a merchant of Boston, conceived the idea of sending American boot and shoe lasts to Brazil for use in place of their clay models. This soon resulted in sending great quantities of rubber overshoes to Europe and America. The importation of rubber and the manufacture of waterproof garments and articles therefrom now rapidly increased in those countries. But nothing that could be done would prevent the rubber from getting soft in summer and hard and brittle in the winter. Something was needed to render the rubber insensible to the changes of temperature. For fifty years, ever since the manufacturers and inventors of Europe and America had learned of the waterproof character of rubber, they had been striving to find something to overcome this difficulty. Finally, it became the lot of one man to supply the want, 
His name was Charles Goodyear. Born with the century in New Haven, Connecticut, and receiving but a public school education, he engaged with his father in the hardware business in Philadelphia. This proving a failure, he, in 1830, turned his attention to the improvement of rubber goods. He became almost a fanatic on the subject, going from place to place clad in rubber fabrics, talking about it to merchants, mechanics, scientists, chemists, anybody that would listen, making his experiments constantly, deeply in debt on account of his own and his father's business failures, thrown into jail for debt for months, continuing his experiments there with philosophical, good-natured persistence, out of jail, steeped to his lips in poverty, his family suffering from the necessities of life, selling the school books of his children for material to continue his work, and taking a patent in 1835 for a rubber cement, which did not help him much. Finding that nitric acid improved the quality of the rubber by removing its adhesiveness, he introduced this process, which met with great favor, was applied generally to the manufacture of overshoes and helped his condition. But his trials and troubles continued. Finally, one Nathaniel Haywood suggested the use of sulfuric acid gas, and this was found an improvement. But still the rubber would get hard in winter, and although not so soft in summer, yet the odor was offensive. Yet by the use of this improvement, he was enabled to raise more money to get Haywood a patent for it while he became its owner. In the midst of his further troubles, and while experimenting with the sulfur mixed with rubber, he found by accidental burning, or partly melting of the two together on a stove, that the part in which the sulfur was embedded was hard and inelastic, and that the part least impregnated with the sulfur was proportionately softer and more elastic. At last the great secret was discovered. And now at this later day, when $50 million worth of rubber goods are made annually in the United States alone. The whole immense business is still divided into but two classes, hard and soft. Hard or vulcanized, like that called ebonite, or soft it may be, as a delicate wafer. And these qualities depend on and vary as a greater or less amount of sulfur is used, as described in the patents of good year commencing with his French patent of 1844. Then, of course, the pirates began their attacks, and he was kept poor in defending his patents, and died comparatively so in 1860, but happy in his great discovery. He had received, however, the whole world's honors, the great council medal at the nation's fair in London in 1851, the cross of the Legion of Honor by Napoleon III, and lesser tributes from other nations. It can be imagined the riches that flowed into the laps of Goodyear's successors, the wide field open for new inventions and machines and processes, and the vast added comforts to mankind resulting from Goodyear's introduction of a new and useful material to man, a material which takes its place and stands in line with wood and leather and glass and iron and steel. But rubber and steel, as we now know them, are not the only new fabrics given to mankind by the inventors of the 19th century. The work of the silk room has been rivaled, and a wool as white and soft as that clipped from the cleanest lamb has been drawn by the hands of these magicians from the hot and furious slag that burst from a blast furnace. The silk referred to is made from a solution of that inflammable material, a tremendous force known as gun cotton, or paroxylum. Dr. Chardonnay was the inventor of the leading form of the article, which he introduced and patented about 1888. The solution made is of a viscous character, allowed to escape from a vessel through small orifices and fine streams, and as the solvent part evaporates rapidly, these fine streams become hard, flexible fibers, which glisten with a beautiful luster and can be used as a substitute for some purposes for the fine thread spun by that mysterious master of his craft, the silkworm. The gusts of wind that drove against the molten lava thrown from the crater of Kilithlawa, producing, as it did, a fall of white, metallic, hairy-like material resembling wool, 
suggested to man an industrial application of the same method, and that the great works of Kruk at Essen, Prussia, for instance, may be witnessed a fine stream of molten slag flowing from an iron furnace, and as it falls is met by a strong blast of cold air, which transforms it into a silky mass as white and fine as cotton. End of section 32 End of Inventions in the Century by William Henry Doolittle